Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Council's October 19th Council session. Uh, we will begin today with a proclamation to recognize Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So let me turn it over to Council Member Nevado. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, as we all know, October is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And uh, we have a tradition here on the County Council of recognizing um, this month and to raise awareness, to make sure people know that it's important to uh, you know, adhere to preventative measures, to get your mammogram, to visit your doctor, to make sure that you take this very seriously. We all know that still today, one in eight women in the United States would be diagnosed with breast cancer. So it is so important uh, that we raise awareness of this issue and that we uh, talk about it as much as possible. So, so critical. Uh, and so today we are going to actually um, do something a little bit different. We're gonna do, we're gonna have an update on a previous uh, honoree, Three Sisters, because uh, it, it's a really amazing story, but then um, we are also going to uh, uh, honor and uh, recognize uh, uh, Lisa's uh, LIDS, which is uh, such an important uh, service and such an important endeavor. Uh, I, uh, as I was reading the description of what uh, Lisa's uh, LIDS does. Uh, it just brought back a lot of memories. Uh, as all of you know, uh, my younger sister passed away from breast cancer after, um, you know, dealing with this terrible disease for almost eight years. And uh, I recall very vividly having to accompany her to find uh, wigs and to find head coverings. And it, it is such a surreal experience. Um, and in her case, in our family, we used to always joke because she had the most extraordinary head of hair. <laughs> All of us were so envious. And so to really deal with this loss and also insert a sense of hope and a sense of sisterhood, it is something that sometimes we, um, we take for granted. Uh, so it, it really spoke to me when I um, read about some of the work of this extraordinary organization. So I welcome all of you uh, here today um, to talk a little bit about how our community comes together in different ways to raise awareness and to provide support. And I would be remiss if I didn't also mention the council member Kirk Rice um, alerted me this morning. He, he said, make sure to also say that men get breast cancer as well. And he has a family member that is also uh, dealing with this at this moment. And so it is important to, um, to just familiarize yourself, to, to understand exactly um, all the different ways in which this disease does affect us. Um, and so that is why we are here today. And so let me just, in terms of updates, so three sisters, um, as we all recall, now they do um, have actually a new fire engine. Uh, and this was uh, unveiled on October 2nd. And uh, Dickie, the fire engine, is actually the same fire engine that uh, Marshall, who is uh, the founder of this extraordinary um, uh, organization, was assigned during his 11-year career with the Montgomery County Fire and Rescue. Uh, so this is a very special uh, moment and a very special fire engine uh, in the hearts for the three sisters' families. And, uh, and as I said earlier, uh, Lisa's lids came about as a result of founder Lisa Tapunaki's Zaru's own battle uh, with breast cancer back in 2011. And, uh, and it really has done great work. As I said, uh, assisting county residents who may be lacking the financial means to cope with the side effects of cancer treatment. Um, and of course, their mission is to supply a wide variety of hair coverings for women fighting breast cancer, including wigs, hats, and bandanas at no cost to families. And uh, so this is, a, this is a really uh, important and wonderful endeavor. And I applaud all of you who are doing this. We know that there are very, lots and lots of really amazing organizations that are assisting our residents and it's really difficult to, um, to choose who we recognize each year, but I think it's so important to highlight um, the work and the spirit of the mission of organizations such as the ones that we are going to hear from today. So, um, so from the bottom of my heart, I wanna thank all of you um, for being here. And what we're going to do is that we're going to uh, watch a really quick update of the uh, Three Sisters uh, or, uh, organization effort. It's a really uplifting update. And then I will ask um, Lisa 
Saru, the founder and executive director, to say a few words uh, after the video. So if staff could please start the video. I'm Shannon Moneymaker. I am the executive director of 43 Sisters. It is a beautiful morning, and I don't think we could have asked for a more perfect day to celebrate and unveil Vicky, our pink fire engine. I'm Marshall Moneymaker, a.k.a. the pink fireman, for those who don't know. While I was a career firefighter in Montgomery County, I lost three of my sisters to breast cancer. Uh, Vicky in 2008, Penny and Valesse in 2010. So that's three sisters, two years apart. You know, I isolated myself, I was depressed. One thing led to another and I uh, said, let's do something positive with this. I reached out to uh, Fire Chief Goldstein and uh, asked if I could get a donation of a fire truck. So this is a wet down ceremony. It started with the Navy. When officers got, get promoted, they generally get wet down. Uh, the fire department has adopted that ceremony. When you get a new uh, piece and it gets put in service, the community comes together and performs a wet down. Fire Chief Goldstein of Montgomery County Fire and Rescue is going to wet Vicki down sort of a passing the torch so to speak to us and then she will officially become ours oh up top yeah. so we have big plans in store for vicky she has a huge mission she's more than just a pretty pink fire truck right so we want her to raise awareness we want people to be excited to see her we want people to see it and think oh god i've got that prescription for my mammogram and my purse i'd like to invite mr craig wilson is with nancy navarro's office she definitely wanted me to stop by and bring this proclamation. She has been uh, a huge supporter of Four Three Sisters. These kinds of organizations provide an extraordinary, extraordinary element of support. More importantly, we'll be taking her into low-income and under-resourced communities, which are often communities of color. Uh, we want to take breast health information to those communities. That the truck is a draw for the community to come see the truck, so that we can capture their attention. Sincerely. Great honor and opportunity to be able to do this for you. Thank you, Chief. And I'm glad that we were able to help out. Thank you. Thank you. That was really awesome. Uh, it's it's wonderful to do these types of updates because um, you know when we first uh, brought them and honor them, uh, they were in the process of acquiring. Uh, the fire truck and it's awesome to see that they've been able to to get um, you know Vicky going and that it's going to do incredible work throughout our county. Uh, so now I'd like to invite uh, Lisa Zaru, founder and executive director, uh, to say a few words about uh, her work and uh, how people can get involved and how people can also be served by this great organization. Lisa. Lisa, can you hear me? Wonder if she can hear me. Oh, not sure she can hear me. Lisa, can you hear me? I see that she's unmuted, but I don't know if she can hear. Well, let me do this. I'm going to read the proclamation and then we'll come back and see if Lisa can hear me. Whereas October is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And since the program began in 1985, there has been a gradual reduction in female cancer in women aged 50 and older, and death rates have declined since 1990 due to better screening, early detection, increased awareness, and continually improving treatment options. And whereas one in eight women in the United States, or 12% of women, will develop breast cancer at some point in her life, making breast cancer the most common cancer among women except for skin cancer. And whereas Montgomery County is fortunate to have many partners such as Lisa's lids across various disciplines that raise awareness about the importance of early detection of breast cancer and provide services to those who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. And whereas Lisa's lids was founded in 2011 by breast cancer survivor, Lisa Takunaki Saru, a lifelong Montgomery County resident as a way to assist women dealing with hair loss and other side effects of cancer treatment. And whereas Lisa's lids supplies a wide variety of hair coverings for women fighting breast cancer, 
including wigs, hats, bandanas, and scarves, at no cost to patients or families, as well as helping to connect residents with information and find free mammogram services. And whereas this month, we stand with the mothers, daughters, sisters, aunts, and friends who have been affected by breast cancer. And we recognize the ongoing efforts of dedicated advocates, researchers, and healthcare providers who strive each day to defeat this terrible disease. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes October 2021 as Breast Cancer Awareness Month in Montgomery County and recognizes the contributions of Lisa's LIDS and all those who help to prevent, detect, and treat cancer and who work toward a future free from cancer in all of its forms, presented on this 19th day of October in the year 2021. And let's see now if, Lisa, can you hear me? Yes, okay, wonderful. I think you're muted, if you can unmute there. Wonderful. Oh, we still can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Is there someone else that may want to? Oh, is there someone else that may want to speak? I think we can't, yeah, we still can't hear her. Well, yeah, this is odd. <laughs> Council Member Katz, we can't hear you either. I think I see you talking, but you can't. That was my uh, fault. Uh, Erica Erder was waving. I don't know if she wants to speak or. Yeah, I see her. We were just trying to see if, if uh, Lisa was going to say something. Erica, is there something you would like to add instead then? Let's see if we can hear you. Just trying to get Lisa to see Lisa's that she was attention. muted so we can't see her or we can't hear her. Yeah. Um, Lisa, can you hit the mute button? She's unmuted. We just can't hear what she's saying. I don't know if anybody, uh, council staff that is in the back end, if they can signal something to her, maybe. I don't know. No, it's not working. Well, this is really unfortunate because I really wanted to hear her story and, and we have to move on with the agenda. But, you know, just to say to all of you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being there at the most the difficult times, at the, at the darkest moments. Um, this is really uh, amazing and it speaks volumes to who we are here in Montgomery County and the dedication of our residents to always do something, you know, that is constructive, that is inspirational, that helps others. That is just the spirit uh, of generosity that we celebrate uh, every day because it is important, especially during these times. So thank you everybody. And we'll make sure to get the proclamation over to Lisa's lids and, uh, and we'll be checking on you to see how things are going as well. Thank you. And my name is Jerry Van Reenen and I would just like to say on behalf of Lisa's lids, thank you so much. We work very, very hard. Lisa works tireless hours organizing and I just wanna say thank you so much for the recognition. Um, I don't know why her stuff's not working today but we all are very grateful for the recognition um because she does everything out of her own pocket and we yeah. volunteer tireless hours so again we just want to say thank you thank you so much jerry i appreciate you so stepping much. in and sharing some of the <laughs> amazing work there i'd also like to say yes. can you hear yes, me Deborah. yes we can hear you here tani i'm the cancer navigator nurse at medstar montgomery in uh, only maryland and uh, we really cannot thank Lisa Liz enough. We, she, she does all the hard work. They, the beautiful head coverings come, uh, get delivered to us, so that we can really offer a lot of options to patients. Like we're not in the area hospital many doing this and has consistently done this. And her team is just amazing. We just, uh, I, I can show you a hat that came this morning, just out of one that they're always a lot of options, beautiful things that people are so grateful for. And uh, it's a wonderful, caring touch. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, we, we let's stay in touch because this is an extraordinary story. And I know that uh, there's pro there are probably a lot of people who would love to volunteer and would love to support your mission because there is a great need for this type of, of help. Thank you, everybody. I'll turn it back to you, Council President. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Navarro, I just want to thank you for recognizing this really important 
um, uh, event every month and doing everything for years and doing everything you can to raise awareness. And I, I really wanted to thank all of you as well for your work. Um, in, I have I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to work on state legislation that passed to get carcinogenic flame retardants out of uh, all the furniture, mattresses, and children's toys in Maryland. And the three sisters were part of the coalition, testified to Annapolis, did great work. Uh, your work on environmental health work, I don't think was recognized. And uh, it was great to have the moneymakers involved and uh, the fire truck and everybody. And it was, it was uh, great to see that uh, uh, component of your, your uh, public work as well. So thank you so much for doing everything you can to keep our public safe. Have a great day. Okay, next everyone, we have a uh, proclamation to recognize White Cane Awareness Day uh, presented by myself. This was requested by the National Federation of the Blind. The white cane is an essential tool that gives those who are blind the ability to achieve a full and independent life. It allows our blind neighbors to move freely and safely, to explore and navigate our environment, and to, as President Lyndon Johnson said, come and go on their own. They allow, allow blind people to move freely and safely, but more importantly, provide the ability to travel independently and live independent lives. We must recognize the importance and continue making every day, every effort possible to empower those with disabilities. White Cane Awareness Day is truly a symbol of independence for those who are blind and a recognition of the work we have ahead of us to offer full opportunities to those who are blind. This includes efforts to expand employment opportunities in the labor market on both the county and the state level. So we recognize White Cane Awareness Day every year, technically on October 15th, and recognize the important role the White Cane plays in giving blind people the ability to live independently. Today, we are joined by Debbie Brown, Tom Bickford, Yasmin Reyazunid, and Dante Wren. Ms. Brown, um, are you with us as well? Um, yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, let me turn it over to you for some brief remarks, and then we can read the proclamation. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm I'm Debbie Brown. I am president of the Sligo Creek chapter of the National Federation of the Blind of Maryland, and I'm I don't own a camera, so um, oh. um, I'm just a little I'm a little backward here. Um, <laughs> so, but I appreciate um, um, President Hucker for for um, proclaiming. White Cane Awareness Day. Now, the we it started out as White Cane Safety Day to teach people to be careful about blind drivers and make the streets safe for blind uh, blind people, <laughs> protecting blind people from drivers who who didn't pay attention. That's what I meant to say. And it now we try to expand it to White Cane Awareness Day. Um, and we want to make sure that people are able to travel freely with their white canes. And we want people to be able to do what it is they intend to do when they get to wherever they are traveling. So we, we have expanded our interest to, in the proclamation, you're going to hear some things about employment. Because most one place you want to go is to work so you can make some money to travel where you want to travel. And we are also concerned about accessibility issues. Um, of our employment, our workplaces, so that we want our technology to be accessible. Um, and we do commend the county for addressing the issue of, um, of accessibility of our streets. And we have, you know, we're happy to many of us are contributing to that effort and we're happy for the work that's been done, but Unfortunately, the county does have some work to do in this area. So accessibility is an ongoing issue and we are certainly interested in helping the county to make our streets more accessible, to make our environment a friendly place for blind people and people with disabilities. And I wanted to introduce to you the people that are here with me today. Um, I have Yasmin Reyesiden, who's a member of the Sligo Creek chapter, and uh, in her day job, she works for the Montgomery County government. Um, and we also have Tom Bickford. I think Tom Bickford is our oldest member of our, um, our chapter, and he has been in the county for a long time, 
And he has also written a book called Caring Feeding of the Long White Cane, which is um, one of the very few books that teaches blind people how to travel independently because it was once thought that blind people ought not to try that on their own. Um, but um, he thought that it was a good idea for people to have that information. So um, we thank you for uh, this proclamation and um, we can turn this back over to you, uh, President Hucker. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Brown, and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, let me read the proclamation. It begins, this is a proclamation of the Montgomery County Council, whereas the white cane demonstrates and symbolizes the ability to achieve a full and independent life and the capacity to work productively in competitive employment. And whereas the white cane empowers people who are blind with the ability to move freely and safely from place to place, makes it possible for those who are blind to fully participate in and contribute to our society and to live the lives they want. And whereas every resident should be aware that the law requires that motorists and cyclists exercise appropriate caution when approaching a person who is blind and may be carrying a white cane. And whereas Maryland law also calls upon employers, both public and private, to be aware of and utilize the employment skills of our residents who are blind. And whereas Montgomery County and the state of Maryland, through its public agencies and with the cooperative assistance of the National Federation of the Blind of Maryland, can and should facilitate the expansion of employment opportunities for and greater acceptance of individuals who are blind in the competitive labor market. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, proclaim October 19th, 2021 as White Cane Awareness Day in Montgomery County and calls on our schools, colleges, and universities to offer full opportunities for training people who are blind, on employers to hire individuals who are blind, and on all residents to recognize the White Cane as a tool of independence for those who are blind and respect pedestrians using a White Cane on our sidewalks and on our roadways presented on this 19th day of October, 2021. Um, thank you, signed by myself as council president. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, stay in close touch with us and let us know every way we can help. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Okay, colleagues. We can move on to general business. Madam Clerk, could you please share the announcements, the agenda changes, or the petitions? Yes, of course. Good morning. Good morning. So under general business, we do have two announcements. The public hearing for the FY22 capital budget and amendments to the FY21-26 capital improvements program. Transfer of funds for the Charles W. Woodward High School reopening project is scheduled for October 26, 2021 at 1 30 p.m. Persons wishing to sign up to speak may do so beginning 10 21 21. The public hearing for the FY22 supplemental appropriations and amendments to the FY21 26 capital improvements program transfer of funds capital projects is scheduled for October 26, 2021 at 1 30 p.m. Persons wishing to sign up to speak may do so beginning 10 21 21. The council has not received any petitions this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. The clerk has distributed minutes to council members for the meetings of September 14th and for the closed session meetings of July 20th, 26th and September 28th, 2021. Are there any changes? Hearing no objection, the minutes are approved as submitted. Great to see Woodward project moving forward, thanks to the council addressing the CIP. Um, the council can now sit for the district council session. First item, item 2A, is the introduction of zoning text amendment 2108, landscape contractor use standards. Um, I'll recognize Ms. Ndu in a minute. I will just uh, introduce this ZTA a little bit. I'm very excited to introduce it to cover landscape contractor use standards. As the zoning code currently exists, landscape contracting is a conditional use in the agriculture, rural, residential, residential estate, and R200 zones. But So this uh, ZTA would allow landscape contractors to become a limited use in the stated zones as long as certain conditions were met. The ZTA will also add the growing of plant materials to the definition of landscape contractor use. This will certainly help many of our small contractors in Montgomery County establish themselves in parts of the county where it's currently financially unfeasible to do so. Um, Ms. Ndu, morning. 
Good morning, council members. Uh, so I don't have too much to add here. Um, I can go through some of the specifics of the ZTA. Uh, so as a limited use, there'll be certain requirements. Uh, first, the lot area will have to be at least two acres. There will be certain building and parking setbacks as well as screening and a requirement that larger equipment is stored indoors. Uh, heavy commercial vehicles will be prohibited and there'll be a maximum number of motor vehicles allowed on the lot. Um, this use will not include offices, so just the story, the storing of the machinery itself, um, and then any lighting uh, must be by motion centers during the evening hours to be respectful to neighbors. Um, and that's it for the CTA. Great, thank you so much. Okay, I think we can move on to item two B. That's action on ZTA twenty one oh four overlay zone Germantown Churchill Village. The Fed Committee recommended approval. Uh, Chair Reamer, I think, will be with us in a moment. He's back. And Ms. Dunn, welcome. Uh, Chair Reamer. Thank you. I apologize. I thought we were starting at 9.30. Um, oh, you're right. I'm sorry. We're, we're not accustomed to being ahead of time. No, exactly. All right. Great. Um, well, I believe this is to implement the Germantown town sector plan, right, Ms. Nadu? So I'll let you describe it, but it's very somewhat, it's pro forma process that we have in order to ensure that the zoning changes reflect the intent of the master plan process. So we write these, give them plenty of time for public scrutiny, and then we adopt them usually without any, a great deal of discussion. So Ms. Nadu. Thank you. So this CTA was introduced at the request of the planning board on July 20th, um, and it's to adopt the Germantown plan for the town sector zone which the council actually adopted in July. Uh, so to put the plan into effect, we have a ZTA, and then um, next on the agenda, I believe, is the corresponding sectional map amendment. Um, so for the ZTA, when the zoning ordinance was updated in 2014, it removed the town sector zone, um, and that zone was unique because it allowed different types of uses and structures than your standard residential zones. Um, specifically a substantial amount of open space and then some neighborhoods serving commercial uses. So what this overlay zone does is it addresses some of the irregularities that were caused between new and existing developments when the TS zone was taken out. Um, so this overlay zone covers about 1,272 acres of land. Um, so it's gonna grandfather in the existing by right uses from the town sector zone so that they can continue as non-conforming uses. Um, and then if there's redevelopment of a property or an existing use is expanded, um, that's limited or conditional under the new zoning code, that that's the provision that you would use for that, ex um, for that expansion or change. Um, this overlay zone is also gonna protect a lot of public open space as well as recreational areas. Um, and then it'll address some compatibility issues between existing and anticipated development of the vacant parcels. Um, so the Fed Committee unanimously recommended approval of this CTA. So it is set for um, a roll call vote, I believe, today. All right, Any, thank you, Ms. Ndu. Any questions? Okay, uh, the Fed Committee uh, recommends approval. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Mr. President, we'll do it a real, roll, roll call. Roll call. Okay, my notes are wrong. You're right. Uh, yes, Clerk, could you please read the roll? Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass, vote yes. Uh, Mr. Jawando, is he here? Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Abernas? Yes. Mr. Abernas votes yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. The ZTA passes. Congratulations. Okay. Um, item 2C is a work session and action on sectional map amendment H139 to implement the approved and adopted Germantown plan for the town sector zone. Is there a motion to approve the amendment? So moved. Councilmember Reamer sec moves. Councilmember Rice seconds. Um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Mr. President, the yes. SMA is a roll call. Oh, sorry, roll call vote. My notes are wrong twice. Go ahead, please, Ms. Madam Clerk. Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Uh, Mr. Jawando, he's not with us yet. Mr. Reamer? Yes. 
Mr. Amor votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Abernoff? Yes. Mr. Abernoff votes yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Great. So that SMA passes. Um, Next is item 2D, and that will be a briefing on the Great Seneca Science Corridor Minor Master Plan Amendment. The public hearing is scheduled for later today. So, Council Member uh, Chairman Reamer. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, express support or appreciation to the council for supporting this. You may recall uh, maybe two years ago, uh, I proposed that we reconsider the zoning and the, the allowances for uh, development in the Gaithersburg area where we have some of our strongest growth in life sciences, and um, you know we want to make sure that there aren't unreasonable constraints, unnecessary constraints, uh, ill-considered constraints on the amount of bio facilities uh, that could be uh, put there. I, I want to say this: you know, we took this up. I propose this. We took it up before this pandemic, and we are experiencing a bit of a surge in life sciences investment, and it's exciting to see. Um, at the time, it might not have been, you know, so clear to everyone that that life sciences is a real opportunity for us. But we took this up, we considered it, and we asked the planning to uh, come back to us with some recommendations. So we're going to get a, a briefing on that. Um, you know, we can we can talk about that. But again, appreciate the council's support for this proposal. And there are projects that are moving ahead now in this area. There's a lot of great things happening and uh you know it's it's fortunate that we were ahead of the curve here uh as well thank you thank you councilmember rice yeah so i just briefly wanted to say that this is uh it's not the same but it's similar to what we saw in clarksburg uh when we had a master plan that was restricting development in some areas until certain things happened uh that was all well intentioned in terms of the master plan but unfortunately things don't always happen the way we plan them out. Uh, and we need to continue to answer the call uh, that our community and our society sees. And so I couldn't agree more with what Councilmember Reamer said uh, that we certainly see that growth that's in the life sciences in the I-270 corridor. It is an appropriate time for us to make sure that we're providing opportunities for those businesses to grow, which means that they, then we have opportunities for people to be employed with great jobs that have great futures. Uh, we also end up answering the call of what it is that we're seeing with a lot of the healthcare challenges that we continue to see uh, that plague this world, not just our region. And so uh, from that perspective, this is just a really good uh, way to analyze and say, we may need to adjust some of the things that we've put forward as restrictions, uh, well-intentioned, uh, but also understand that we don't want to stand in the way of progress that's going to benefit uh, this entire community, and I mean that worldwide community. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, who's leading us through this? Ms. Sanders? Uh, thank you, um, oh. Council President. This is Carrie Sanders. I'm Chief of Mid-County Planning with the Montgomery County Planning Department. Um, we're pleased to be before you today to present uh, the Great Seneca Science Corridor uh, Master Plan Amendment. Um, minor master plan amendment, uh, the first phase of it. So um, thank you very much for the introduction. I think um, a lot of these um, statements about about the the sciences corridor and how that growth is, is really important for the county, both for um, job creation, but also for livability, sustainability, and housing options. Um, those are all really, uh, I think, uh, well-timed for the the plan that we're bringing before you. Um, and I think the other thing I wanted to hit on before I turn it over to the project manager, Marin Hill, um, and the project supervisor, Jessica McVeary, is that um, we feel that we have uh, provided an amendment that's that's fairly technical in nature and that um, I want to make sure you understand that we're not looking at um, zoning changes with the amendment, but more um, changes, a minor change to the staging of the plan um, that allows these life sciences uh, opportunities to come to the county um, and, 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 and grow over the next uh, year while we do a more um, robust uh, amendment um, later. So 
I'm going to turn over to Mara now to walk you through a brief presentation, but we're happy to um, bring this to you today and look forward to working with you on this plan. Maren, I don't think we we hear you. Okay. Sorry about that when I shared my screen, uh, everything else disappeared. Um, so good morning. Um, my name is Maren Hill uh, from the Mid-County Planning Division um, with Montgomery Planning. And um, I am here to present the planning board draft for the Great Seneca uh, Science Corridor Minor Master Plan Amendment ahead of the public hearing this afternoon. Um, and just to echo uh, a few things that the council members and um, uh, Carrie Sanders mentioned that this is really an opportunity that we took to um, reevaluate some of the 2010 um, planning uh, vision and look at how it had played out on the, uh, on the ground. Um, and this really focused on um, the staging requirements that were established in the 2010 uh, Great Seneca Science Quarter Master Plan. These requirements address the timing and the, of development and the provision of key uh, public facilities. Um, but as Council Member Rice mentioned, and uh, as well as Council Member Weimer, they're concerned that this staging was adversely affecting progress towards the 2010 uh, plan vision, as well as hindering development in the life sciences, which as you are aware, is a key economic driver in the county. Um, so really, uh, you know, this was added to the planning department's work program in December of 2019. And in July of 2020, Montgomery Planning launched this amendment um, with the purpose of supporting economic development and opportunity in Montgomery County. The life sciences and other job creating uh, development has been signed in this area in recent years due to the staging constraints. And this amendment um, is reviewing the progress of the 2010 plan. And we believe it offers recommendations to amend the staging requirements that will enable continued growth. Um, as Ms. Sanders mentioned, this amendment is not a traditional master plan amendment. It doesn't provide uh, recommendations for land use, zoning, transportation, parks, trails, or open space. Um, it really evaluates the 2010 plan um, and focuses on staging requirements as well as identifying future opportunities for planning um, in the area. Uh, oops. Yep. All right. Um, so in evaluating the progress over the last decade, there are really three critical factors that, that show us that require this amendment. Um, the first is uh, the Quarter Cities Transit Way or the CCT, um, which was really a centerpiece of the 2010 plan vision. Um, right now it has an uncertain uh, future with M uh, Maryland Department of Transportation has no uh, future plans for funding, which is a requirement of the stage two uh, requirements for development that are found in the 2010 plan. And as uh, the council is aware, there's currently a um, concurrent planning effort corridor forward the I-270 transit plan that is um, evaluating the uh, the quarter cities transit way among other uh, transportation priorities um, in this uh, corridor. Um, the second critical factor is that right now, commercial development cannot proceed in the life sciences center um, that was identified in the 2010 plan because of the staging requirements that were developed in the 2010 plan. Development in uh, capacity in stage one has been allocated, um, which means that uh, additional commercial development and approvals cannot pr proceed until all prerequisites for stage two have been um, accomplished, which includes uh, the full funding of the CCT between Shady Grove Metro Rail Station and Metropolitan Grove. Um, and lastly, as both uh, council members Reamer and um, Rice commented, this area is the epicenter of the life sciences industry um, in our county. And there's a pressing need to accommodate life science uh, development to support the county, the county's economic health, but also, uh, and, and promote um, employment growth, but also to further advancement in science 
um, including the development and distribution of life-saving vaccines, as we've seen, is incredibly important um, over these, this past uh, nearly two years, year and a half. Um, so just, uh, just so everyone's clear where this is, these are, this is the boundary of the, uh, the 2010 plan, and it covers a kind of unique geography. Um, both the areas that are clear as well as the purple area um, comprise the 2010 plan boundaries. And it's kind of, I like to say like a slice of, of Swiss cheese um, with the Western, Western residential neighborhoods of Quince Orchard, um, as well as the National Institutes of Science and Technology in the center of, um, of this map and the Life Sciences Center um, in purple. And these are surrounded by the cities, the municipalities of uh, the city of Gaithersburg, the city of Rockville and the town of Washington Grove, which are shown in um, yellow, pink and, and brown. Um, so it's a disconnected um, plan area. But um, for the purposes of this minor master plan amendment, um, we focused on the Life Sciences Center, which was, um, identified in the 2010 plan. Um, and this area um, is the only area from the 2010 plan that is subject to staging requirements. And it's also where most of the new development is occurring. Um, the, the Life Sciences Center uh, in 2010 was seen where it was envisioned as a biotechnology, healthcare and higher education hub um, that would support medical center, research facilities, uh, academic institutions, as well as private uh, companies. Um, but also, um, it was imagined that there would be an array of services and amenities um, for residents, workers, and visitors, and that this would really be a vibrant live-work community um, and would be uh, serviced by an extensive trail system and gridded street system um, as well. Um, and... Um, uh, and then uh, uh, the centerpiece of this vision really was a high-quality transit center assist transit system envisioned as the um, quarter city's transit way. Um, it was essential to the 2010 plan um, and it was the basis for many of the land use and zoning recommendations. Um, and it would connect both the Life Sciences Center internally as well as um, externally to other residential communities and transit hubs. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the future of the CCT is now um, uncertain um, as MDOT has no plans to fund the CCT, and the county is exploring an array of transit priorities through corridor forward, um, while the uh, Montgomery County Department of Transportation is implementing some near-term transit, um, transit in the area that will connect the LSC through the Great Seneca Transit Network. Um, so I've mentioned staging a couple times. Staging uh, limits development until um, certain milestones are achieved. And I just wanted to give council an idea of what uh, what type of development allowances were allowed through staging. Um, so despite the uncertainty of the funding and construction and operation of the CCT, uh, it remains the centerpiece of the staging requirements uh, in the four stages of development um, from found in the 2010 plan. So in 2010, um, there was approximately 7 million square feet of existing development already built in the Life Sciences Center. Um, and uh, so that's the 7 million in blue. And there was also 3.7 million of approved but unbuilt development um, that existed at the time. So this had already been approved by the planning department but had not yet been built. And um, Stage one only allows an uh, only allowed an additional 400,000 square feet of development capacity, while stage two would uh, would release 2.3 million uh, square feet of development. Stage three another 2.3 million, and stage four uh, another 1.8 million. So you can see it all stacked up um, for a total of about 17 uh, million square feet. At this point, um, currently the 400,000, we are in stage one. That is the uh, stage that we have uh, that we have achieved right now. And the 400,000 square feet that was available as part of uh, stage one has already been allocated, which means under the 2010 plan, no new uh, non-residential development can pursue 
can proceed until all of the staging requirements for stage two have been met, including, as I mentioned, the funding of the, the full funding of the CCT. Um, however, there is this substantial residential development uh, capacity that remains in stage one. Um, and there's also uh, some of that approved but unbuilt development um, that I mentioned that still exists. So approximately 2.47 um, million square feet of approved development has not yet uh, been built, but could be at any time. Um, so the planning department, uh, the planning staff has developed two recommendations as part of this um, as part of this uh, uh, amendment. Um, the first is to release an additional 400,000 square feet of non-residential development capacity that would be um, available immediately through an interim stage without adding any staging requirements. Um, and, uh, and I'll get into each of these. And the second would be to initiate a new um, comprehensive uh, minor master plan amendment after, uh, after this one is wrapped up that would address the departures and barriers from the 2010 plan vision that were identified through this amendment, as well as the staging requirements and to integrate, integrate countywide plans and, um, and initiatives. And um, the, the first recommendation that would allow the 400,000 square feet of development capacity to be immediately uh, available in this life sciences center area the planning department um, estimates would accommodate between two and four um, four projects um, and would not um, substantially impact um, the traffic that was imagined in the 2010 plan um, at the time after stage one. Um, we do recommend that this 400,000 square feet would exclude two of the districts in the Life Sciences Center that were established in the 2010 plan. That is the LSC West and the Bellwood districts, which are shown, it's a little hard to see, but in that kind of red maroon color on the map. Um, and the reason for this is that currently Bellwood, the Bellwood district has 1.4 million square feet of approved but unbuilt development that could be constructed before needing new staging allocations. And the LSC West District, um, which is just south of Key West in that red area, um, recently was um, a project was approved, a 44-acre uh, residential, primarily residential project on the former PSTA site. Um, so most of that district also has development that would not be, um, that is not affected by the staging requirements, and therefore we are recommending um, is not uh, available to use this additional 400,000 square feet of development capacity. Um, and the second recommendation that would establish a phase two amendment, um, this, this amendment would begin in uh, February 2022, and it's consistent with the uh, FY23 work program that was presented at the semi-annual. Um, it would integrate the recommendations of the corridor forward plan, which is scheduled for council review uh, in the winter of spring, winter and spring, upcoming winter and spring. Um, the second phase amendment will also provide an opportunity to align the vision um, recommendations and overall staging requirements of the 2010 plan with the county's defined goals, priorities, and values, including the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act, Thrive Montgomery uh, 2050, and Vision Zero, among many others. Um, and I think it will also give uh, us an opportunity to examine the overall vision and staging requirements of the 2010 plan, um, including transportation, land use, and zoning recommendations, um, because there are significant issues in the area, um, and uh, there are obviously other planning efforts like corridor forward that will greatly impact uh, the area potentially. So it will allow us to um, review these recommendations um, with guidance on the CCT uh, and other developments in the area. In terms of next steps, uh, there is the council is holding the public hearing this afternoon at 1.30 um, on the Great Seneca Science Corridor Minor Master Plan Amendment. Um, the Fed Committee work sessions will begin in November, um, with November 1st being the first work session. Um, which will uh, at some point this winter be followed by the plan adoption and approval. And then, as I mentioned, phase two of the amendment, which is completely separate, uh, but will be a 
um, comprehensive look at the 2010 Great Seneca Science Corridor Minor ma uh, Master Plan um, will uh, initiate in February of 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and there I conclude my, my presentation. Could we could, could we maybe take the slides down for the discussion? Yes, sorry, I'm trying to navigate to it. No worries. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Orland, welcome. Um, okay, uh, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and I'm somebody that believes that the Carter City Transit Way's alignment should be changed anyhow. I, I'm, I'm concerned about the alignment in general. So I do, I do agree with uh, taking off those, those uh, uh, mandatory uh, recommendations. But this was actually part of a deal, maybe the wrong, wrong word, but it was part of a deal when this plan was done, was the, was the phasing part of it, the staging part of it. How much community involvement have you had up until this point for those who were so involved in the when the when all of the staging was was uh, part of, of what what was finally done? How much of community involvement have you had now, up to now, on this these discussions? Sure, I'm going to give a thank you for your question, uh, Council Member. I'm going to give a, a kind of two part response to that. Um, is we have uh, continued to work with our implementation advisory committee, who has been um, working with planning over the past 10 years on the implementation of the 2010 plan. Um, they were also very helpful in connecting us with um, community members in the area. Um, and we held um, one community meeting uh, on our own and then uh, two community meetings that were in partnership either with MCDOT um, or with the corridor forward team. Um, in addition uh, to that, one of the, I think this really gets to the heart of, of your concern is one of the reasons that we really felt like there needed to be a phase two is that the staging was a compact with the community. And we, uh, we take that very seriously. Um, and we, we believe that we needed more time to fully engage with the community with knowledge about, as you said, the guidance um, on the alignment of the CCT and other developments and that this should be a longer process with robust community uh, outreach and engagement. So we really see this phase two as an opportunity um, to, to get more people involved um, and, and have the time to do it. Because as I mentioned, for the reasons that Council Member Reamer and Council Member Rice uh, pointed out, this felt um, very imperative because it was stymieing important, life-saving uh, you know, research and development in the area. So we, we did believe that there needed to be um, action taken immediately, but I do think that phase two will get more community involvement, although we have had community involvement throughout the process. Okay, thank you. Sure. I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Chairman Reamer. Thank you. Um, again, I'm glad we did this. I just think we should reflect on this a little bit. You know, we want our economy to grow. We want our life sciences sector to be booming. And yet we've had rules in place that essentially have granted all the development rights to one company, uh, which is Hopkins Control, and they've decided not to build anything so far, or very little. And as a result, there's really, even though when you drive there, you can see there's plenty of land, you know, there's plenty of capacity there. If a large company wanted to come into this county and say, I'd like to put up a brand new facility right there, there isn't a county place for them to land if they don't want to do a deal with the Hopkins controlled property owner. That's how we hurt ourselves. <laughs> that, that's how we, you know, work against our own interests just year after year after year after year. And, you know, I think it's caught up to us. If you look at the boom of life sciences 
in Frederick County, you know, what you're seeing is land is available, it's affordable, they can do the process quickly, and major facilities are going in there as a result. So generally speaking, I think we've got to get out of this kind of way of thinking and have more flexibility. Why we would prohibit, you know, commercial development <clears throat> is just beyond me. And, and frankly, I think the question really needs to be looked at as to whether there's enough capacity that has been, uh, you know, allocated here. But, um, but final, final comment, uh, you know, the, the prospects for funding the quarter city's transit way are now different. Um, as you know, the governor has committed that if the, when the contracts are final for the managed lanes project that they will fund a transit program that could be the quarter city's transit way, or it might not be, you know, we have a process that we have to go through to figure out what we want to do. Um, but I just wanted to observe that because I, I think it's good for us to think rethink transportation in this area and make sure it's a smart program. Um, but uh, there is there is also, you know, imminently uh, a, a somewhat different context. But generally speaking, just wanted to make the, the main point that, you know, it's great that we do we're, we, we're, we're doing this. I think it's an approach to planning that is very restrictive, generally speaking. And I hope that, you know, in the future, we can be more flexible uh, in how we do our planning to uh, allow the private sector to, you know, bring us the benefits that they're trying to bring. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else on this topic? Councilmember Nevada. Mr. President. Mr. President. Yeah, Councilmember yeah, Nevada. I, um... No, I appreciate Councilmember Reamer's um, observations there because I think that it is so important to uh, acknowledge that as we have made land use decisions, many of those decisions were predicated on the circumstances and on particular projections and particular desire to uh, be able to take advantage of creating this kind of ecosystem. And there's no doubt that the pandemic really, truly has come to redefine and I think also fast track a lot of changes. And we have seen that in some instances, uh, and so this is one example, I think Viva White Oak is another example. We need to re-engage and figure out how to best position those particular opportunities uh, given what we have just gone through. And actually it might just open up uh, other kinds of very exciting um, you know, opportunities uh, for innovation and for doing things a lot differently. I mean, the, the nature of work has changed. So there's just so much that now we're trying to integrate. Um, so I see these types of um, decision points as, as opportunities to align with where we are today. And, and it's actually pretty exciting, um, but there is no doubt that we need to do something with regards to this uh, area. I mean, it was, it was definitely envisioned to be one of those very active nodes. Um, and, um, you know, I'm still bullish about Viva White Oak as well. I always say that we have got to do all of the above, uh, especially now as we look at post COVID-19 recovery. So, so anyway, good. Uh, I, I think this is a good direction that, that we're headed into and I, and I appreciate uh, the, the work thus far. Fully agree. Anybody else on this? Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Orl and Ms. Sanders and your team. Um, I think we can move on to item 2E. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate your hard work on this very important topic. Uh, Councilmember Juando, do you have a housekeeping matter? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning. I just wanted to be noted in the affirmative for items B and C uh, for the district council session that I voted yes. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, you all set? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. So item 2E is the introduction of ZTA 2109, Office and Professional Biohealth Priority Camp. A public hearing is scheduled for 1130, uh, I'm sorry, November 30th, 2021 at 1.30 p.m. Uh, I will uh, recognize Council Member Friedson. Thank you, Council President. I'm really proud to be introducing this green taping measure, which will provide an expedited regulatory review process for the biohealth industry. It's modeled after the 
signature business headquarters ETA, which was passed by the prior council uh, and created in response to the Amazon bid in 2018, uh, but not used. This BioHealth Priority Campus ZTA provides an effective tool to help attract new cutting edge companies to our county and retain those who are already here that are primed to expand. Uh, it'll allow life sciences and biotech businesses to focus on life-saving research, product development, needed trials, uh, and not have to uh, focus as much on burdensome regulatory requirements, which can always be a challenge. We know that Montgomery County is a premier location for biohealth, given our access to the nation's capital, our proximity to federal agencies like NIH and FDA and our highly educated talent pool that comes from all over the world uh, to be here at the uh, epicenter of, uh, of, of health and research. Uh, but we can't rest on our laurels when it comes to growing our economy and we have to build on our strengths. That's what this is attempting to do. It coincides directly with the county executive's economic advisory group report recommendations, which call for streamlining the regulatory review process for our priority industry sectors of which biohealth is at the top of that list. Uh, and that is exactly what uh, we are doing uh, with this measure. Uh, thank you to uh, Council Member Reamer, Council President Hucker, Council Member Albernaz, who already offered to co-sponsor this measure. And I'm very grateful for their support. Certainly welcome other colleagues to support uh, as well and look forward to uh, moving forward this important economic development tool to move one of our most important priority sectors uh, forward and make sure that we're building on the great strengths that we have here in Montgomery County. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, thanks for this great CTA. Council Member uh, Chairman Reamer. Thank you. I want to really thank uh, Council Member Freitzen for diving into this uh, you know, important one. We, we really do need to loosen up some of our approaches and, and uh, allow our life sciences sector now to, to boom. Um, and uh, this specific idea, I think, is a, a really good adaptation of you know, what we devised for the Amazon process. Uh, it's something that uh, you know, I, I'm just really enthusiastic about, and I'd like to see us uh, get it done. So thanks very much, and let's make it happen. Thank you. Uh, Council Vice President Albernoz. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to confirm I was listed as a co-sponsor because I signed on late yesterday, but uh, thank you, Council Member Friedson, for acknowledging that. Um, this is, I think, a, a really good idea and just demonstrates that we absolutely are open for business. You can directly connect it to the last conversation we just had uh, and the comments of Council Member Navarro um, that we, we do need to be aggressive in our approach and there have been several um, market study recommendations that we do double and triple down on our biosciences as an opportunity for tremendous economic growth. Um, at last check, there were something like over 30,000 jobs already here um, in the biohealth space. And when you compare that to federal government jobs, active, which is around 68,000, it's our next biggest sector um, and growing and one that we have tremendous opportunities to enhance even further and become a destination spot globally. So uh, we, we need more of these uh, types of pieces of legislation, uh, creative solutions to complex challenges. And I wanna thank Councilmember Friedson and his team for putting this together. Uh, happy to be listed as a co-sponsor and look forward to the ongoing dialogue. Thank you, Councilmember Nevado. Thank you, Mr. President. I also would like to be added as a co-sponsor. Thank you, Councilmember Fleetson. This, I think it's another extraordinarily important step forward um, as we are trying to achieve the goals that we were just discussing. Uh, and I know that this will be welcome news and it will definitely create, um, bring some results forward. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Fleetson. I agree with everything that my colleagues have said, and I too would like to be listed as a co-sponsor. Thank you. Council Member Glass. Good morning. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I too would like to be listed as a co-sponsor, and I appreciate uh, Council Member Friedson uh, you know, giving some of the background uh, as to the, the formulation of the ZTA. And quite frankly, what the pandemic has shown us is two different things. One, that Montgomery County remains home to the research and technology uh, that is helping save lives here in the U US and across 
the globe. Uh, and we need to, as, as has been said, double down on that. And then the other aspect of it is that the pandemic has shown us that we need to change our regulations and that change is possible and that change is needed. And so uh, the, the combination of the times, I think, set us up nicely for the CTA and other measures here in Montgomery County to show that we are not only home to the bio life sciences, uh, but that we will uh, be home to even more of those companies in the future. So thank you, Council Member Friedson. Council Member Juwando. Thank you, I uh, would like to be added as co-sponsor as well. Great, is that everyone for this item? Okay, um, Council Member Friedson, thanks again. Ms. Ndu, thanks again for your analysis, very helpful. And I think we can move on to the next item. Thank you, item three is a briefing on the state police reform legislation, uh, particularly the provisions that went into effect on October 1st, 2021. Um, I think we're being joined by AC Frank, good to see you. Dr. Stoddard, good to see you. I think Captain Ermey and Lieutenant Satinsky potentially. Um, looking forward to this uh, important update. Thanks so much to Susan Frog for closely tracking all these state level reforms and to our um, our uh, uh, Annapolis team, um, and also Susan for tracking all the, there's been so many multiple reports and recommendations we've seen about the implementation and the execution at the county level. Police reforms, obviously an issue that we care deeply about, all of my colleagues, um, and feel passionate about. We've had so many discussions over the last several years and, and even longer than that uh, about potential legislative action to uh, improve our, our policing and our improve our community trust. Um, but there's always been a common thread that our legislative options at the county level were limited by what state law and particularly the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights uh, would allow us to do. So uh, I think we're all very glad that the laws passed by the General Assembly this year are consistent with the objectives identified by the council earlier. Um, I was with Chairman Smith last night and let him know that we were holding this briefing. He was very happy to hear that. Um, I know we're all grateful to him and uh, Vice Chair Waldstriker and Speaker Jones and all of our delegation for their leadership to make so much progress on uh, these issues, which will go a long way toward restoring community trust uh, in our police and we're really grateful for to Chief Frank and uh, Chief Jones for the work they're doing behind the scenes to send a strong signal that the department is uh, making a lot of progress as well and committed to it. So thank you all for joining us. I'll turn it over to Ms. Frog. Uh, thank you. The council president hit all the salient points on this. I just did want to note that this today's presentation is primarily dealing with the um, provisions that went into effect last October 1st, and a great majority of the provisions will actually be effective uh, July 1st, 2022. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to point out there's a link in the staff report to the dashboard that the county executive has made, which gives a really great rundown on all the different um, aspects of police reform going on in the county, including the task force to reimagine public safety's recommendations and the preliminary audit findings as well. And again, is the state uh, law changes as well. So I'm just going to turn it over to Assistant Chief Frank, if he'd like to go through his presentation. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, Council Members. We appreciate you giving us uh, time to talk about what we've done, what we're working on. Uh, with me uh, is uh, my uh, co-chair. Uh, I've been lucky enough to work with uh, Assistant uh, uh, Chief Administrative Officer Earl Stoddard. He's uh, been a great addition to our reimagining public safety implementation committee. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here if I can, just to keep uh, keep things rolling. If I don't, uh, here we go. Um, Chief, I got multiple texts that you had an important meeting and you, we couldn't be late. So I want you to see we got to you early. We're looking well, to I, I will say I will say uh, Susan allowed a, a, a bunch of time uh, for us to go through this, and I. I let her know that I, I may be uh, granting some wishes on your behalf of getting you folks back to other important business if I can be succinct today. So, uh, but thank you for that. I appreciate that, Council President. Glad you're here. Um, so uh, again, as Susan said, we, we want to go through what we've implemented so far. And then at, after I uh, conclude on that and take any questions, We'll also talk briefly about uh, what lays ahead for the re for the uh, implementation committee over the next year, uh, and and how the council uh, uh, and the county executive play play a part in that. I will say that uh, 
uh, a lot of the changes this year were very specific to the department um, uh, as far as implementation. Uh, so the, all of this started in April of 2021 when we finally got from the Maryland General Assembly the reform package. Um, the, uh, the reforms that are in place, they have been staggered across 2021, 2022. And uh, as many of you are aware, there are also uh, implications in there that other uh, that parts of this do not go into effect until July 1, 2023, when the current collective bargaining agreement with FOP Lodge 35 uh, sunsets. Uh, the uh, unless, of course, something is something is uh, renegotiated before then. Uh, so so far, there are five bills that we've implemented uh, here in Montgomery County. They're the ones again were mandated by state law to do. Uh, there's State Bill 156, State Bill 178, 178, State Bill 600, uh, and then State Bill 187 and House Bill 240, which cross over, and then House Bill uh, 1248. So when these changes first took effect, Chief Jones uh, directed me and an internal work group to begin the implementation process. Uh, that actually coincided with County Executive uh, Elrich uh, establishing his reimagining uh, Public Safety Implementation Committee. Now that committee looks over at not only the Police Accountability Act, but also the uh, reimagining Public Safety uh, task force report and the ELE4A audit uh, that is ongoing of the police department. So that, that group deals with all three of those. So internally, though, we worked on the Police Accountability Act and reported out to the implementation committee. Um, the internal work groups involved uh, SMEs that were uh, the subject matter experts that were uh, uniquely qualified to offer guidance. Uh, we also involved the county attorney's office in, 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 uh, in looking at some of these laws because they, some of them were quickly written and we needed some interpretation. Um, the, uh, let's just get into the actual ones. At the beginning, I'll go over some, some easy uh, lifts for us and then uh, towards the end talk about the more difficult uh, items that we have tackled. So this was the first uh, one that uh, went into effect, State Bill 156 regarding retired canine care. And I will say again, and, and this is the case for all uh, a lot of these items, is that Montgomery County Police have been a leader, Montgomery County government has been a leader in these areas. We have already been taking care of our retired canine uh, canines to a degree with food and with certain medical costs. We do that through our police foundation. But State Bill 156 mandated that uh, uh, any after uh, any uh, dog that retires after October 1, 2020, uh, will receive uh, compensation for veterinary care, re uh, reasonable and necessary veterinary care, and that's a twenty-five hundred dollar uh, yearly. Uh, limit and a $10,000 lifetime benefit. Uh, so internally, we worked with Neil Shorb of our, of our, who heads our management budget division, and mm -hmm. we've uh, built this into our, our budget in the coming year. This year, we can absorb it and it'll become a light on it, line item as we grow and we have more dogs join, uh, join that needed uh, care. Uh, so that was fully implemented on July 1, 2021. Really an internal thing for us other than the uh, budget uh, going forward. Uh, House Bill 240 under forensic genealogy, it established, um, it basically established rules in uh, for using forensic uh, genetic uh, DNA genealogy. Uh, we actually have a fantastic investigator here, uh, Detective Smajerski, who's, who's really become nationally recognized. If you saw the news, uh, I want to say about two months ago, uh, about two months ago, the uh, uh, he assisted a case down in uh, down in uh, North Carolina. Sorry about that. My budget guy, Neil Shorb, keeps calling me. Um, the uh, established ending a cold case down there. Uh, the uh, so we've been a leader in this, and um, this just outlines for our detectives and for our, our lab um, the. Uh, uh, the circumstances which we can enter information in and we can search for information and it really kind of puts some uh, uh, put some policy in place which we already had so we, we've been happy and we've actually been working with the state on implementing this 
Um, House Bill 1248, uh, GOCCP notifications, uh, beginning March 1st, 2022, we're going to have to report out to the uh, Governor's Office of Crime Control uh, and Prevention any cases in Montgomery County where uh, there's been a monetary settlement uh, uh, for uh, against uh, the law enforcement agency. Uh, that's just an added thing for our policy and planning division. They make many notifications, so that's been implemented. Um, well, I want to. I just got to note that these may not be progressing. Does everyone see State Bill 178 MPIA? Very good. Thank you. Good. Um, so this one right here, uh, State Bill 178. Uh, prior to this going into effect on October 1st, internal affairs files were not uh, considered personnel files. They were not released under MPIA rules. Uh, State Bill 178 changes this and uh, opens those files under specific circumstances that are outlined in the law uh, to MPIA requests. Uh, the, uh, uh, the only, and, and actually uh, when I say specific, it's not that specific, it's a pretty broad uh, swath of files that, that are now subject to release. Uh, really the main things for us, technical infractions, right? Minor rule violations, like if, if my sergeant discovered I wasn't using um, my uh, uh, body-worn camera on, on in an instant instance that's a, a very minor uh, nature, like I didn't activate it in time, for example, as opposed to when I got the call, I activated it 30 seconds if, after I got there. That'd be a minor rule violation if that was investigated by our Internal Affairs Division. That would not be released. But other items specifically, and most importantly, uh, allegations where uh, officers have been involved with uh, dealing with the public and an allegation is made, um, those, those will be uh, released provided they, there's not a uh, reason for denial. Uh, and again, there's a very limited reason for why things would, uh, would have a denial. Uh, we've embraced this as uh, we want to be as transparent as possible. Uh, it is a tremendous change and it's a tremendous uh, uh, for law enforcement officers, it's something for them to get used to. It's caused some trepidation. Uh, there are redactions that go that that will occur with these files, uh, specifically having to do with medical records, uh, certain identifying information, uh, like a social security number, uh, the things that you would expect that we don't want in uh, 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 public hands for identity theft or issues or issues like that. Um, this was implemented October 1st of 2021. Uh, we got our, we actually got requests prior to October 1st, 2021, but with the law, we, we politely uh, denied those requests and asked them to resubmit on October 1st. Uh, we are working through our first uh, releases. Um, in doing so, this has created a, a good amount of work for our folks. We have many, we have a couple different things that need to be redacted. We have the file itself, we have to go through uh, and make sure there's no information in there. And what I will say uh, to go along with that, we've had to go about a process change. Uh, our files up until now, for the most part, while there were digital, digital parts of it, are a paper file. Me as a commander, when I was doing my findings on an internal affairs case, I would go to internal affairs and pick up a binder and that binder would contain all the paperwork, all the video, uh, all the transcripts that I need. Uh, we are changing our process down in our internal affairs so that we're making everything digital uh, to be in a secure cloud location uh, so that we can easily meet the 30 day deadline of this law. Uh, but in getting ready for it, we've had to hire uh, uh, three contractors uh, uh, to work with uh, number one, getting those files to a digital format, at least the paper version, and then also the redaction of body-worn camera that's going to be released with it. Uh, we, don't get, we don't get requests for every single body-worn camera. It takes a long time to redact those videos. Um, I think the last, sat, the, the last stat I saw is 10 minutes for every one minute of video. It might actually be a little bit more than that. It's a tremendous burden on our technology uh, division to do that, and we have to make sure that we set them up for success so that the county meets its obligation to release these files. Um, the, uh, uh, we have worked also in our GovQA system, it's our, basically our organizational system, to make sure that we're tracking all of these requests and we do hit our deadlines. 
Um, I already spoke to the fact that we changed the uh, our, our, our internal affairs work process to to having secure digital files. Um, we're going to uh, the really going forward with this particular aspect. It's going to be what permanent staffing we needs we're going to have uh, as these requests come in. Uh, we have found over the last year that uh, the amount of our MPIA requests uh, have uh, doubled uh, in some cases and, and are going to get even bigger because of technology. We have a lot of different things at our disposal, specifically video that takes time to redact. So right now, while we have contractors, we're going to assess what occurs over the next six months and make budget determinations from there about permanent staffing that we're going to need. Um, so we're in a good place there. Uh, what I will do, since I'm kind of getting into the meat of these uh, implementations, I'll stop on this one rather than wait to the end. Are there any questions on uh, State Bill 178's implementation? Can, can I just ask you, um, is there any analysis of why the MPIA requests are doubling? Is it <clears throat> members of the public, individuals, or is it um, um, you know gov other government agencies or, or think tanks or... I th it hasn't been government agencies. It's just people are becoming, it's more like an educational thing. People are Individual. becoming more aware uh, of, of the requests that are out there. Right. Um, and, and when I also say doubling, the workload doubling is body-worn cameras, as it's known that it's out there, that those requests are becoming more and more. And that really is the big one that we're struggling with. We have, uh, I think I've spoken to council before. Uh, up until recently, we had one individual that was doing those redactions and he was working 70 hours of overtime uh, a pay period. So he's basically doing two jobs and we were still uh, behind the eight ball. So we're fixing that. Um, okay, thank you. Councilmember Juando, are you on this topic or at the end? Uh, since, yeah, I have some on this. I have a couple of questions on this topic. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, since, since we're doing that, which I think makes sense. Uh, Chief, Chief Frankie, thanks, thanks for suggesting that. Um, on the uh, MPIA requests, so you said there's a third. The, the law establishes a 30 day deadline, right, mm -hmm. to, to return. Uh, so it's October. I think I know what day it is. It's the 19th today. Yes. So for the ones you got on October 1st, do you have a sense of how many you got on that first day? Uh, so we had. Uh... Don't quote me exactly. I want to say we, I'd request on 11 officers that day. Okay. Um, and I've had a couple more trickle in after that. Okay. Um, so those will be coming out no later than October 30th. Correct. Okay. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of these, one of those requests is I'm, I'm sure is related to the situation at East Silver Spring and the, and the five-year-old and the disciplinary records for those officers. Yes. Um, this council, myself specifically, others, we had a whole session where we asked what happened. And we were told at that time under current state law, because it hadn't been in effect yet, that the answer to that question about what the discipline was for those officers that screamed at the child and handcuffed them, what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd still like those answers. Um, so you can provide it now or you can provide it as you do. I know I'm, under, I know I'm sure members of the public have requested it. But it opens up a larger question of specifically to that case, but also more uh, broadly, when the council has questions in its oversight capacity, are, how, how is it best for us to interact with you to get those answers? Are they treated as, a, as an MPIA request and we sh we're expected to wait 30 days or we're going to get answers to those questions more quickly as staffing allows? So you can, if you could address that. So, uh a uh, very good question, and uh, I, we've had some internal discussions on that, and what we're looking at is, is handling it as an MPIA process, just to make sure that we're in complete uh, compliance uh, with the state law, uh, compliance with federal law, and uh, we also have to afford the opportunity, uh, and, and with that, there's a couple different things that go on. Uh, one of the things I didn't speak speak to in this particular aspect is the officers involved and the uh, uh, have the right to uh, contest an MPIA. Uh, it's not to say they would, but they're, they're afforded that right as well. So right now, uh, I anticipate that we're going to stick with the MPIA process. Certainly, uh, uh, I believe Chief Jones would engage in further discussion with the council and we can talk about this 
uh, this process further and make sure we're all getting what we need. Um, but I do think um, for this aspect, 30 days is, is, is good and, and, and we are obligated to stick to that uh, and, and make uh, best efforts to get to that. All right, well, we can, we can come back to, you know, to that. I think there's a difference between, you know, when we have a session on a specific topic and the answers should be given then versus, mm -hmm. you know, a offline mm -hmm. conversation. So I, I appreciate that. Sure. Um, and so, you know, I, I would just ask that you don't need to make news today, but I, I expect to see, and I'm sure my colleagues do, the, the results of those MP, that specific MPIA request. Related okay. To the the fight the incident related to the East Silver Spring. Okay, very good. I, I will I will speak with uh, I will speak with my staff and and we'll speak with uh, Council President Hucker about the best way to go go about that. Again, I, I my main thing is I want to make sure that I that I, I abide by the the rules that are written and the rights of the rights of everyone involved. So we we will certainly discuss that and and uh, we will get back to you on that. Okay, I appreciate it. That's it for on, on this topic. Thank you, Mr. Okay. President. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And thank you, Chief uh, or Frank, for being here with us today. I do have other questions as we go along, but on this one topic, um, I, I do believe it is extremely necessary that uh, that we make certain that the information that we are giving is is uh, is uh, is accurate and and uh, transparent mm -hmm. and and correct, and everyone's and everyone's. Uh, 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 rights have been have been protected. So I'm in agreement with that. If someone requests these MPIA requests, is that public knowledge at that point? And are the answers that you are giving, is that, uh, does each person have to ask individually to get that information for the answers that you're giving? Or is that published somewhere? So no, we, we, we answer the, the individuals that, that put in an MPI re request specifically. So it wouldn't be posted a call, uh, like on a, um, on a website for an individual for a mass viewing, it would go directly to the individual that made the specific request. Okay. I, I thought that was the answer, but I wanted to double check on that. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, Chief, I think we're back to you. Okay. Very good. So uh, next up is State Bill 178 regarding search warrants, and the the the, uh, the biggest issue at play here has been in the media a lot over the last uh, two years uh, regarding no knock search warrants. Uh, Montgomery, prior to State Bill 178 going into effect, uh, Montgomery County Police had a, a very robust and serious policy about no knock search warrants. Uh, they were for the safety of not only the officers but the occupants of a of a location and the neighbors of a location. State Bill 178 further refines those, uh, those uh, requirements. Um, uh, the, uh, it talks about the uh, putting in new processes, for example, uh, conferring with the state's attorney's office on uh, seeking approval for a no-knock search warrant. Um, it talks about uh, the hours of service for a no-knock search warrant being limited um, to, uh, I want to say, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., unless there's an ex exigent circumstance that can be explained. Um, uh, talks about, uh, now, outside of the no-knock search warrant in or search warrants in general, which I think is very important, is the use of uh, readily identifiable officers that, that you see someone coming into your residence that's clearly a police officer. Um, use of uh, further expansion of use of body worn, uh, body worn camera videos if it's uh, consistent with policy. Uh, one of the big uh, issues here with the search warrant for us in, in, in State Bill 178 is a 22nd wait time uh, between knocking uh, on, on the variety that are not no-knock, but a 20-second wait time between when you knock on the door uh, and when you make entry into a location. Uh, it also talks about more restricted use of uh, tools such as flashbangs. Um, uh, so this was implemented October 1st. Uh, we internally, we've issued, a we, we work with our special operations division uh, that, uh, that uh, are very experienced who they also, they worked with their partners um, in, in special operations to find out best practices. 
So um, they have amended their their practices, and we and we are ready to meet this twenty second wait time. And certainly, the investigators on the other side with the requirements for doing a no knock, they they've been trained up. Uh, we've trained not only our supervisors and our executive staff, but we've we've trained our detectives in it. Uh, the, uh, as I said before, SWAT has revised, uh, uh, some of their, uh, some of their methodology. Uh, we've worked with the state's attorney's office. Uh, the, the, the issue that, that, uh, confronts us on, on this implementation that remains to be seen is the increase in the officer safety issues, the, the, the safety of the individuals in a, in a location and the safety of neighbors. Um, I, I can't stress enough that 20 seconds of time is a lot um, when you're talking about uh, dealing with, uh, certainly everyone's seen, uh, unfortunately, the violent crimes that we've been confronted with in this, in this county. We've seen uh, a, a surge in gun violence and our detectives, our SWAT team members, our officers are doing search warrants uh, on suspects in those uh, uh, in the suspects in those cases, uh, houses, apartments, and so they're entering an unknown with people that uh, we suspect to be armed. So it causes us uh, great concern to make sure that we not only meet the obligations of State Bill 178, uh, but also we uh, protect all of those involved in this very serious case. We think we have good footing, but we will see. Uh, as time progresses, the, the, the additional challenges and officer safety that we face. Um, are there any questions on State Bill 178? Councilmember Katz? <clears throat> Councilmember Dwanda? Yeah, I, just I one. have nothing on 178. As I say at the end, I do, but gotcha. not at this moment. Thank yeah. you. Councilmember Dwanda? Yeah, just uh, one, thank you. One quick question on this one. Obviously, there is a count, you know, our use of force bill that we passed uh, last year, mm -hmm. uh, addressed no-knock warrants in part, uh, not, not the timing issue specifically, but limiting to drug cases that didn't involve guns, for example. Um, obviously, even though you're talking about the state bill today, the, the policy is still consistent with the county pass law as well, right? Because this is the state law, you have to obviously abide by that, but nothing prohibits us from going further, which is what we did prior to this law being passed. Uh, correct. Okay, just wanted to confirm that. And uh, as, as part of that um, reporting process, uh, is there are there reporting processes connected to this part of the bill that were increased? The so internally, we've we've uh, made a more a more robust uh, reporting in, internally for us i apologize i'm going over real quick reporting as far as service of a warrant it's changed from 15 days to 10 days at least to the judges involved and as far as reporting elsewhere i'm gonna have to check on that and get back to you sir okay i appreciate it Thank but you. we do but we do but again i, I do want to emphasize um one of the things that we've done uh, under chief jones leadership over the last two years is really uh uh, beefed up our internal record keeping on on search warrants because it is a very important issue. So we do have very, very good data to share. Yep. And I'll just use this as a reminder. We had talked about in the use of force policy of having a front facing document for the public. Now that the state law is done on the use of no knock warrants, um, uh, just so that they're aware of what is and is not happening, that, that takes into account both the state and the county law. Um, and so I just want to remind if you could take that back, I think that'd be useful so people know what the expectations are. Very good, I'm taking a note real quick, sir. Right. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Chief. Okay. All right, so State Bill 600 death investigations, and this is really going to be um, uh, the, uh, this is gonna cause a great deal of change for us in certain circumstances, at least for our interactions with council, with 
the public because of uh, just information. Um, and you see, I noted at the end here, communication is going to be a challenge, but let's go through it real quick. So State Bill 600 created an independent, independent investigative unit under the Office of Attorney General, and they will be uh, responsible with investigating any deaths of individuals uh, involving police. And uh, the real basic uh, recounting of this is officer involved shootings, uh, arrest related deaths. Uh, if some of you certainly recall, we've had a couple of instances of that, whether it would be taser, um, most prominently a taser use that, that has resulted in death in the past. That would be investigated uh, by this investigative, uh, by this independent investigative unit. Also, um, if we are in a uh, some sort of vehicle borne event where a suspect um, it, it dies, for example, if we are in a pursuit and the person being pursued wrecks uh, and uh, expires, then the independent investigative unit will in, will take hold of that um, investigation, even though it's traffic related. Um, so. Uh, they, the state uh, and the attorney general, and we did make a request for them to be here today. Uh, they are more than happy uh, to come and speak to council about the changes. But I, I will say, I think we're very qualified um, to speak to what they're doing and give you all the information you need. But again, I want you to know that 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 uh, uh, offers out there by the uh, office of the attorney general. So their independent investigators will be responding. So let's, if we have an event, an effective October 1st, um, if we have an event, we will notify the state through, uh, through the uh, Maryland State Police and they will, they will send, we will talk to them about the incident that occurred and make sure that they are going to take investigative responsibility. Uh, and, and again, if it involves a death, they are. There are some unique things uh, that, that we're gonna need to talk through that I just don't think anyone thought about uh, and, and you don't know it until it confronts you. So when I say we have to talk with them about it, I think there's going to be unique things that we need to talk through. For example, um, an incident where, where, where an individual is injured and it's likely that they're going to die. You have to talk about that with the state and talk about their condition, talk to nurses, and then a decision will be made. So there's a lot of communication that's going to go on. So the state has has uh, has put in that that they want to be able on scene in one to two hours, um, and and they will take charge of the entire investigation, um, separate of any exigent circumstances. They will be interviewing, collecting evidence, um, doing all the things that our major crimes division or our collision reconstruction unit would have done. We are going to be holding everything in place. So when an event occurs, uh, our patrol officers will secure the scene, our supervisors, our duty commanders will start directing activity, and our emphasis will be to hold everything in place until we can begin this conversation with the, with the independent investigative unit supervisor uh, and start making determinations there. Now, when I talk about exigent circumstances, if we're in the middle of a tropical rainstorm and evidence is gonna be destroyed, we are going to talk with the independent investigative unit and say, this is why we need to collect evidence X. We need to collect up these shell casings because they're going to get swept away. So we will have the resources there to do that. Uh, Chief Jones, Assistant Chief Patil have our, our investigators primed and they will be responding out as normal so that if there is an as, as, as exigent circumstance, uh, they can respond appropriately. But again, they will be in standby mode as we wait for the state to come in. State will come in with uh, resources from the Maryland State Police for uh, evidence collection, uh, crime scene uh, issues, documenting. Uh, and then again, it will be, it's completely in their hands. Um, the body-worn camera is of interest. Body-worn camera, the release of that will no longer be in our control. Uh, that will be controlled by the independent investigative unit. Uh, they have uh, written in their written in their protocols uh, that uh, they will make best efforts to release that within 14 days. Um, also, with the proper notification to individuals involved. Um, 
the and but again that will come through them that will not come through chief jones uh uh or our department anymore also all of the media other than an initial media statement where we go over very very basic information all of the media will then be controlled by the independent investigative unit uh so all requests will go to them uh for any additional information uh the in, independent investigators will will carry on their investigation just as our major crimes detectives would uh and they would come to a point where they have enough information to issue a re report that report will be given to the montgomery county state's attorney uh to take action on to review and take action on um so we did implement this october 1st uh, we had uh, numerous meetings with uh, the uh, Office of the Attorney General to make sure that we had complete understanding of their expectations uh, and to ensure that we met the law. Chief Jones directed those meetings with uh, Assistant Chief Patil and myself. Uh, we feel very good. But what we have, uh, we've also issued informational bulletins to office to the officers so they understand the process uh, and what is going to occur. And obviously, we've trained our major crimes division and our collision reconstruction unit. I come back to what has become very clear in this process. Communication will be key. Communication between all of us will be key. There are things that the Montgomery County Police will not be able to comment on or give information on because it's specifically mandated by State Bill 600 that the Office of Attorney General and the Independent Investigative Unit is in control of this information. And that's a good thing. They're controlling the investigation to ensure that it's impartial, to ensure that everyone's rights uh, on all sides of these events are protected. Um, so uh, they, they will handle those. And as we go through this, I, I just see us as going back and forth, whether it's with counsel, with the county executive, with us, in talking with the state about the information that's so important to transparency to the public uh, and, and what, what we need, the expectations of our citizens. Um, so with that, on State Bill 600, are there any questions? Um, we got a couple of folks in the queue. Let me just ask, uh, out of this broader bill, but you, you mentioned body board cameras again. I'm still chief noodling about what you said earlier, um, that violations of uh, turning your camera on too late are a technical violation. Um, thinking about the incident in East Silver Spring, one of those officers didn't turn her camera on and uh, one had his on. Um, given that the department didn't disclose the incident to us and we found out about it from the media, mm -hmm. if the other officer hadn't had his camera on, we wouldn't know the level of detail and the public certainly wouldn't at all. Right. And it seems like... Um, I understand, you know, officers might not turn their camera on um, accidentally as an oversight and they might not turn it on intentionally. But regardless of the motivation, not turning your camera on at the right time undercuts the whole purpose of the bill we passed six or seven years ago. The law we right. passed. So um, it's did I hear you right that it's a technical violation and what are the penalties for a technical violation? Um, I assume there's a range in as well, a first versus repeat offense. So let me let me clean up my clumsy example. So I, a that a particular example could be a technical infraction. In the incident that you spoke about, that is not a technical infraction. It's dealing with the public. Um, it's dealing with the public, uh, obviously, in a, in a very profound way. So that would not, in this particular case, that would not be a technical infraction. Perhaps a better example would be uh, Darren Frank was late to roll call four times and it ended up in internal affairs. That's a technical infraction. Um, the body worn camera, there's a slight possibility it could be. I, I regret using that because I don't want to cause any concern. Um, so uh, in, in for when you find that going to your question of uh, punishment or corrective action for not using uh, the the uh, uh, the body worn camera, if it's an intake, it could be counseling a first time offense like someone had a bad day, not on a call dealing with people, but in some other aspect. They didn't tag their video appropriately. They didn't download it in the appropriate amount of time. It could be a verbal counseling or if they're a repeat offender. And again, it doesn't involve the public. Mm -hmm. um, then it could be a written reprimand and it could go up from there in, in an escalating scale, depending on 
how many times, you know, we believe, believe in progressive uh, punishment here. So right. does that answer your question, sir? It does. It's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so uh, am I hearing you right uh, that any time an officer is dealing with the public and doesn't turn their camera on, it's not a technical infraction. It's a more serious one. Yeah, it's a more serious infraction. Those, and and, and when we called? discover those, it's usually connected to something else. Yes. What's your terminology for that? If it's not technical, it's uh, you know what we we went with the legislation for that. That's a that's a formal uh, investigation. That's and that's uh, it's an ID investigation. We we just st stuck with technical. I don't I don't believe we've given the other side of that a term. It's just information that we're going to have to release. But any okay. So anytime they don't turn their body worn camera on when interacting with the public, it triggers an ID investigation. No, when it when it when it amounts to a formal investigation, when it involves some other when it involves some other matter that's brought to our attention, although it could be implemented internally by a supervisor and it ends up and it ends up in a, uh, a formal investigation as well. OK, now you just confuse me again. So if I'm interacting, I'm an officer interacting with the public and I intentionally or not don't turn on my body worn camera. Um, it's not a technical infraction. It's depending on depending on that, it could yeah. be an intake. It's a performance yeah. issue. Uh, I pull over Darren Frank on a traffic stop. Just a a uh, a, a unknown risk traffic stop. I issue a citation, um, and the supervisor finds that a uh, a uh, 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 when he's reviewing, doing an independent, a, I'm sorry, a uh, not an independent review, but a uh, uh, random, random. Thank you. Good gracious. That's why you're in charge, sir. Yeah. Um, uh, a random check of video. And I find that the officer didn't initiate his video on time or he didn't use it for the entirety. That becomes an intake investigation that's handled at the district level and can result in, in counseling and, and, and so forth. Now say that same officer is found to do that multiple times and is just not getting it. That will become a formal investigation with our internal affairs division. And that in particular uh, would be subject to release. Okay, uh, thank you. Chairman Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. You know, um, on on that on that one topic, I think it's it's necessary to to mention that there's hours and hours of body worn camera uh, 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 information, and obviously not every second of every officer's body worn camera uh, information is going to be reviewed every every day. I mean, we'd have to have, you know, thou hundreds of people just reviewing the body worn camera from the day prior. Yeah. So obviously they need to go to a random uh, uh, check. However, if what I believe uh, Commander uh, uh, Chief Frank is saying is that that um, that if they on the random checks, if they happen to check and see that someone has not cut on their body worn camera, or you know, for the moment, that that would be when when those would be determined. I believe I've I believe I'm correct on that. Um, you know, uh, Chief, you mentioned that 20 seconds was a long time when uh, when you're waiting for that for that uh, warrant to be to be served. One to two hours is is a lot of 20 seconds. I understand it's a different it's a different scenario, but it's it's certainly something that that we need to, to keep in mind. And then hopefully the, the state will work with us so that we can, that one, to, that it's never at the two hour time frame, And if it could be within, you know, the half an hour, I mean, it, it would take our, our own police force some time to, to get to that scene as well. Not mm -hmm. just the, the people who are involved in that, in that uh, horrible situation, but people who are investigating it as well. So, they hopefully the the state will be as efficient as they possibly can be, and of course we run the risk that because it's a, a state uh, action that they could have more than one, and it would be a horrible situation. But they could have more than one jurisdiction that needs them, uh, and I know that they're going to be doing some regionalized uh, response, 
but still, I mean, we're, you know, I mean, it, it could be, and I, as I say, I hope it never does, but Prince George's might need them at the same time that, that Montgomery County needs them. So I think we have to keep that in mind. If a, and, and hopefully this will never, ever happen again, but in the, the horrible times that someone is, is killed and it was involving a robbery or whatever, mm -hmm. does the state police investigate the robbery as well? Or does Montgomery County investigate that robbery? No, our Montgomery County investigators uh, would investigate that. That would be assigned to the major crimes division. So they would they would aspect everything to do with they would investigate everything that has to do with the robbery. Uh, and the independent investigative unit will will investigate the officer involved if it happens to be a shooting officer involved shooting. OK. And 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 I did see you and that obviously the independent state investigation turns it over to Montgomery County State's Attorney's Office. Mm -hmm. For many years now, the Montgomery County State's Attorney, John McCarthy, has has turned that over, that part of the investigation, over to Howard County. And I'm assuming that that will continue, that this, that the state law still allows that, that, that a, a uh, neighboring jurisdiction, and the idea being that there wouldn't be uh, any bias whatsoever. I mean, uh, there's a possibility that the state's attorney knew the police officer involved, et cetera, um, that, that that would continue. Is, is that your understanding as well? That's my understanding, but uh, state's attorney McCarthy could always uh, decide to uh, revert to how we did it before, and, and uh, that's, that's within his, but I haven't heard anything about that changing. It's, it's my understanding that he's going to continue, but I wanted to make that, that clear, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Vice President Albernoz. Thanks. Um, just want to express my appreciation, uh, Chief Frank, for highlighting the critical importance of communication. And I know we have um, established, it sounds like, protocols uh, that, that we're going to be working through and taking lessons learned from. I think it would be good to the degree to which we can to um, articulate those protocols for the, for the general public so they can have a better understanding and set of expectations on when, where, how uh, information will be communicated, as well as where do we send folks who have those questions beyond just the media, but members of our community um, as well. So uh, clarity and transparency in that process, as you articulated, is going to be critically important. And you know, the, I don't believe anybody from the Attorney General's office is here, but it would be good to get a follow-up um, and or maybe a response to some formal questions on on those protocols uh, and who specifically within their offices are going to be assigned on the communication front, you know, separate from the investigation, which is critically important. Um, and we'll obviously, as we always try and do here, want to make sure that that communication is culturally appropriate um, and that is it is built in place. Uh, to handle the unique needs of our culturally diverse population. So more points than questions there, but I, I would like to follow up directly with the Attorney General's office to get a better understanding of those protocols. And once we get them, um, make sure that we publicize them so that they're clear. And, and we, will, uh, we will certainly pass that along to them and, and can help coordinate that. And again, I don't, I don't want to step into their world, and, but, I'm, but I, from our interactions with them, I'm sure they're happy to answer those things. I believe this is Frank, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I believe they're, they are hiring a separate public information person for the, the uh, investigative unit as well. So that it will be, the, obviously the, the Attorney, General, Attorney General's office has the public information officer, but there will be a separate unique position for these investigative units. There is, that has been advertised. Great. Back to you, Chief. Wow, okay. So uh, again, I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very proud of uh, the effort that has gone into implementing this. Uh, again, it, it can't be understated that uh, what we've done here in Montgomery County and what we've done in the state of Maryland, it's considered, uh, uh, across the board is one of the most progressive reforms uh, of uh, police reform packages 
to be put in place across the country. And, and we're, we're meeting our deadlines. Uh, on the call is, is Captain Ermey, Lieutenant Satinsky, and Captain Clark, who's, who's uh, running the police academy, couldn't be with us. But they've done a, a terrific job, along with the Reimagining Public Safety Implementation Committee, and ensuring that we hit our deadlines and we get these important reforms in place. I do want to talk briefly about our challenges going into next year, this year. <laughs> We're already here. Um, and one of the biggest ones I want to talk about is the Police Accountability Board. because So this is mandated in House Bill 670. Uh, and it's very clear that this is a going to be developed. Uh, and, and our hope is that this is going to be developed as a, as a co-piece of work by the County Executive and County Council's Office, uh, setting up this Police Accountability Board along with the Administrative Charging Committee. So beginning on July 1, 2022, uh, at least for executives right now, uh, this is delayed for uh, union, uh, Lodge 35 represented officers, sworn officers. But for executives, we need to have this in place uh, for uh, the disciplinary process of our internal investigations, of our formal investigations. So right now, what would happen uh, on a formal investigation is our detectives will do that investigation, we'll put it together in a uh, binder, give that to the commander, and the commander will make findings, and then it'll go to the assistant chiefs if there are sustained charges, um, uh, punishments, uh, uh, if everything's sustained and concurred then there'll be punishments and those punishments are based off previous punishments that, that we have records for within Montgomery County. Uh, House Bill 670 sets up a standardized system across the state. It sets up punishments uh, in a schedule uh, that is going to be created by MPSTC uh, and the determination of whether charges are sustained is going to be done by this, this uh, 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 police accountability board and, the, and ultimately the administrative charging committee. Um, this is a group of individuals separate from the police department, although I do think there'll be a need for subject matter expertise from each agency. Uh, and when I say each agency, it's right now the, the law is written that this uh, police accountability board is set up by the county government, uh, will handle all discipline matters for all municipalities and jurisdictions within there. So for example, uh, Rockville and Gaithersburg would be, their department would be subject to this police accountability board. Now, that's not to say that there aren't changes at the state level and that there's further discussion on that, um, but certainly Montgomery County Police would be subject to this. Uh, so it's a major change. There's staffing that goes with this, uh, uh, full-time staffing. Uh, there's appointments that need to be made. There's county law that needs to be written. And one thing that, uh, that uh, became very evident to Dr. Stoddard and myself as we were doing our last reimagining meeting is that we have a very short timeline for this. Uh, really, we're talking in the next three to four months having legislation drafted along with finding, finding funding for it to stand up this police uh, accountability board. Um, so uh, uh, while I'm glad that it, July, I mean, July 1 offers an opportunity to do a uh, rollout with executives on, on our department and make ensure that we get things right. Um, but there's a potential that, that uh, it, 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 the potential is there to get it right and get all the bugs worked out before all uh, department uh, uh, investigative matters come under the purview of this board. So that's the big one right there. And we're working towards establishing the work group that'll do that. But I wanted to put it on uh, in your awareness uh, so that you know these things are coming and they're very important that, that uh, uh, matters. And, and we're looking forward to this uh, work together in coming up with this. Um, the, other, the other things that are coming online, uh, there are uh, and, and to go with that, the LEOBR uh, uh, going uh, sunsetting, but again, that's July 1, 2023, unless there's some other substantial uh, change. Um, MPSTC is growing. That really is not in our, in our uh, bailiwick. Um, there's some information on traffic stops. I don't know if anyone can see 
And this is actually one of the things that the chief directed that we get forward on. There's actually a couple of things, and it's a simple thing, right? Uh, so the search warrant uh, legislation that is now implemented requires that officers be identified by last name and ID number uh, on a search warrant, uh, but on a search warrant only. Uh, the In uh, July of 2022, uh, and actually July of 2023 because of the CBA, um, there's some rules about traffic stops, specifically having your uh, last name and ID number readily, readily displayed. So Chief Jones uh, directed us to change our name tags, and it's a simple little thing, but you should be seeing it. We're, our name tags now include our ID number, and I will say, President, I spoke with President Holland about this, and you know, as our collaboration continues with Lodge 35, and and he readily agreed. Yeah, let's make that. Let's let's get that change into effect sooner rather than later. Uh, so we'll have some we'll have some changes there that we will work on internally about how we do our traffic stops, and that's actually part of uh, there's some part of information in the audit. Uh, ELE 4A about changing some things with our traffic stop training. Body worn cameras, there's a lot of, lot of changes coming on body worn cameras, except we've already done the changes. We have a robust body worn camera policy, and actually we're looking at expanding the use of our body worn, body -worn cameras beyond uh, what is called for in our collective bargaining agreement. And Lodge 35 uh, has been advocating on the part of their folks for that. And we're working through that process now. Uh, the big thing there is getting funding because as uh, council member Katz noted, there's thousands of hours of video that's created that needs to be stored, that needs to be paid for. Um, so those become just uh, challenges. Uh, and then um, we have some employee assistance issues that we're gonna work through. But I will say the police accountability board uh, is the biggest change and our biggest challenge that uh, we are uh, looking to uh, uh, go through in the, in the coming year, but it's a short year. I'm going to try and unshare un my screen now. This isn't going well. So with that, I guess I'll stop real quick. Any questions on any of those issues or if... if um, There it goes. Um, oh. Any questions on anything, anything I've covered? Cameron, are you, are you good? I see hands raised. I guess I'll, well, I'll start. Actually, while, while we're pausing, can I, can I uh, it's a little bit uh, for the next briefing as well, but I, I understand, we, and we passed, it was, I don't know, six weeks ago, we passed the requirement to, um, that all unvaccinated county employees would get tested weekly uh, and have to show a negative test. But my understanding is we're not testing many or all of our police officers that are unvaccinated. Can you comment on the status of that? Uh, we're working with the uh, with OLR and working with Lodge 35 and well McGeo because we also have McGeo. Uh, we're working through the uh, with the unions on uh, finalizing uh, those protocols, and that's just a process. We're have to we're having to go through. I don't know if Dr. Stoddard wants. Wow. To How, why does it take so long? I mean, we passed this. I think that you know the public believes this is happening. I was very surprised to hear it's not happening. Um, and obviously, some employees are working from home or 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 not in contact with the public. But our officers are out there every day. I think you know they were as well as many McGeo um, employees out on the front lines. Why does why why does working out those details take so long? Because, well, uh, Council President Tucker, uh, so many of the people who are doing the testing before are actually school health nurses who are now back in the classroom or back in the schools. And so we're having to retrain and identify other staff, which frankly are just coming from place. That we're having to pull them. Many activities that were canceled last year, libraries, rec centers, et cetera, are obviously open and operating. And so we're having we're having to retrain and re, re, redevelop a process for getting those test kits out. We had hoped to have rapid tests in place so that obviously we wouldn't have the, log the logistics burden of getting PCR tests collected, run to the lab, tested and, and results reported back that way. And so obviously the fact that the rapid tests have been as unavailable as they have been and the delays in acquiring them have, have let us have to redevelop the, the saliva-based or the uh, interior nasal uh, PCR testing as a, as a, as a temporary uh, 
carry over before we can get those rapid tests in place. And so, so it's, not, it's not about negotiating with the unions that's holding it up. It's availability of tests because we're we're making tests available to the public, as is CVS and Giant and mm -hmm. many other individual retailers every day for free. Why not put all our firefighters and police in a fire truck and run them over to Dennis Avenue? You certainly could do that, but obviously that would be a significant time reduction out of their hours of service, right? So, uh, so obviously we're trying to do it at the station level so that we can not, or not, at, not necessarily at every station, but at, at key points where they're at through the day so they can not have to divert resources over to Dennis Avenue. And, uh, you know, we have I think, three locations where we're doing testing regularly that are not necessarily always um, convenient, number one. Number two, recognizing that we have multiple shifts that work within law enforcement and fire rescue as well. So the nighttime shift wouldn't have an opportunity to go to Dennis Avenue because Dennis Avenue would be operating at that point in time. So there's just details to work through in terms of the testing. C candidly, um, the issues around the the unions agreeing to it have been far less complicated than finding what the right uh, far the, the right test model and getting it stood up are. Again, if we had right. rapid tests readily available, this we would have been doing testing weeks ago. I think that's largely the fact that it has to be a saliva-based test or a uh, nasal swab collection that is the problem because the, some of those just for, are require more personnel support to set up as well as logistics to operate. Okay, I would just think the risk of having unvaccinated. Uh, employees out there dealing with the public far offsets and you could probably you know uh, the unions aren't opposing this and my understanding is they're not you could have them do it on their own time i thought unvaccinated employees it's not much to ask them to get tested on their own time but um telling them to run themselves over to dennis avenue or silver spring or any of the other locations um or there, there are other are there are other, other jurisdictions and i won't name them uh, because I'm not sure they publicly said this, but they attempted to do the same thing. And now they're on the hook for hundreds of hours of overtime because they were, it, they had an arbitration ruling against them saying that you can't ask them to do it outside of work time. So it was this we, seems like a very thing. solvable problem a month after we pass or more after we passed the resolution. Um, anyway, council member uh, Rice. So I just wanted to quickly follow up on that because uh, Dr. Stoddard, you know, you and I have had conversations about availability of testing when it came to our schools uh, and having PCR tests that were available, rapid tests that were available for our students. Um, at the time, I'd also commented about the multitude of private providers that are out there. And so one of the things that I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention, including yourself and the executive team, is that we have a bill before us that's talking about mandating that folks get vaccinated because of the frustrations that folks feel with folks who choose to be unvaccinated, but then uh, don't then get tested. And so, you know, what, what I would say to the county executive to Lodge FO, uh, to, to FOP Lodge 35 and others is that help us to avoid having to, to bring the heavy hammer down by saying mandatory vaccinations and work with us in terms of a, a solution that I think makes sense. Look, I right now could leave my house here in Darnstown and drive over to medical access in Germantown and get tested right now without an appointment. Just walk in there and get a test. They also have locations in Rockville. They also have a location in Silver Spring and I'm not shilling for them. That's just the folks that my family and I use that I refer all of my constituents to because I know that they have a multitude of appointments and testing available. And so if that's there and that's so easily accessible and they have long hours, I'm just confused as to why it's so difficult for us to do this testing and avoid having to go this heavy handed route of saying that we're mandating that everybody get vaccinated. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just close by saying, help us help you. Uh, if, if, if the county executive and if the executive team doesn't believe that uh, mandating uh, vaccinations is the right way to go, then help us to make sure that we have a robust process that's there. We set it up for our school system, so there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to set it up for a small cohort like our police force or our fire or some of our other employees. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's just ridiculous at this point, quite honestly. And so, you know, I, again, just, 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 just please, because you can't, you can't criticize us for considering this other mandate if, in fact, you're not able to do the very thing that we're talking about in terms of working with 
the unions and working with the employees to ensure we have a process that's in place. You can't play at both sides. So. Um, yeah, I just realized it's two and a half months ago that we passed the resolution. And uh, Dr. Satter, did you all submit the implementation plan that you were required to submit by August 20th? I believe we shared information on August 20th. I'll check with Mr. Hartman. I believe he had transmitted something, but. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the my colleagues and, and I are, are wondering, and the public might wonder, if you all can't, in two and a half months, implement a vaccination or test requirement from the Board of Health, how are you going to implement a mandatory vaccination requirement in a timely manner? None of us want to lose our employees or force anybody out the door. Um, but I think Councilmember Rice is right. Um, it's it's hard to understand why these are so widely available to, and we're making them available, and the private sector is making them available to every member of the public. But we're not somehow able to test our own employees, even small cohorts like the thirteen hundred police officers. Understood, Council President. I, I mean, we'll continue to work on this and uh, try and get the answers to the council as quickly as possible. I, I mean, I have no question. There's no question that I'm frustrated that it's not set up as fast as it has been in either. Um, it, I would I would only note that the small cohort doesn't necessarily make it any logistically easier to set up, given that it's a diversity of locations and it's spread across the entire county. And so, you know, you've set up a diversity of locations for the public, the mil one million person public. The fraction of our police officers or fire officers that are unvaccinated is much, much smaller than that. And I bet I'm not the only one wondering how come you can't get a few hundred people to any of these locations around the county rather than if we can attract a million people, uh, put out those multiple locations for a million people. Yeah, I mean, we're just trying not to have the testing program cause us operational deficits in, in a time when we're already struggling to staff put forward facing public safety. And so um, it seems it seem would seem easy to have them divert over to Dennis Avenue and take an hour out of their day get over there get testing get back, but obviously that's from a staffing perspective. It does seem easy. It, yeah. it, it does seem easy, and we don't want to have to fire any employees, uh, which is proposed by the legislation. So, I I would think most of us would rather see them lose an hour out of their day to get tested and know our front facing employees were actually safe, than you know have one more hour sitting in the firehouse waiting for the bell to ring. Understood. I, I will take it back, uh, Council President and Council Members. I, I appreciate the feedback. I, I would be misleading you if I said if I wasn't frustrated at this point, too. And so I'll commit to you that I'm going to push it as hard as I can to get get this. Thank finished. you. I mean, so uh, just to be clear before we uh, I don't want to be a dead horse, but it's not not the unions holding it up, but it's not the availability of tests avail uh, holding it up. I mean, there was, I mean, there was some tests. reasonable back and forth on on what test was best for each in each individual not union so much as as program. Like if you have fire stations, they're operating multiple shifts. The testing model that was best for them is probably different than a testing model that works best for a library. And so there was reasonable discussion around the the way that it, the the methodology of having having the test be collected. But it wasn't a point where the there was a pushback that said no, we don't want testing. In fact, that was quite the opposite. They, they said let's have testing. It was just figuring out the mode of testing. You know, some people sure. have. We gave you a deadline. Bobs and sli they prefer saliva. You know, we, we want to do rapid and they, you know, it, it's sort of um, it's a matter of uh, both marrying the availability of the test with the with the method that works best for the program, not not some opposition. I understand there's all kinds of details to, in, you know, you can always let the perfect be the enemy of the good. But yes, because there's a lack of urgency in so many areas that we have to deal with with your administration. I think that's why we gave you a deadline that will be two months will be expired. Two months will be two months ago tomorrow. If it was October, August 20th, we were supposed to have the implementation plan. And I mean, this is the key question in the implementation plan, and I'm not hearing an answer. Okay, I understand. I, I, we'll work as fast as we can to get you uh, the information you're looking for. I'm again, I thank you. Council Member Reamer. Thanks. Well, I, I mean, I'm not surprised at all. Uh, this is precisely why uh, many council members are focused on simplifying all of this with a straightforward requirement, because it is actually very difficult to administer a testing or a testing out. And I don't think it would be a wise or fair use of county taxpayer resources for employees to basically be on leave you know, from their duties while they travel around to get tested because they refuse to get vaccinated. That, that, that's, that would be an abuse of the taxpayer. 
So there really is no easy answer here, which is why from the very beginning, uh, I and many others were skeptical of the idea that you could have an effective testing alternative to getting vaccinated. And I'm not surprised to hear that other jurisdictions have said that you can't require employees to be tested outside of work. You know, it's a good example of how, how complicated it is. And I think most employees and taxpayers would say, why should we, why should we be paying, you know, expensive salaries and benefits and retirement provisions for people during time when they're not on the, the beat and they're, you know, traveling around to avoid getting vaccinated. So, you know, again, I think this administrative challenge was, was foreseen, you know, it's not a surprise and, um, it should be no surprise, and I think it's why a straight requirement is better, not only from a health perspective and keeping our employees safe and keeping the public safe, but also just from a organizational management perspective and a fiscal responsibility perspective and, and you know, so many others. So um, didn't expect this topic to come up particularly, but, uh, you know, it, it's a good example of some of the challenges that we're facing, that's for sure. Thanks. Uh, Chief Frank. Uh, Council President, that, that concludes my presentation about uh, what we've implemented and, and uh, what we're looking at for the coming year. We will certainly come back and, and have much more to discuss with the Council uh, as we go through the next round of implementation. Uh, and also as we talk about the audit and uh, uh, reimagining public safety, the work that uh, I'm doing with Dr. Stoddard on the reimagining public safety implementation committee, but I appreciate everyone's uh, time. Um, Chairman Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And thank you, Chief Frank and everyone else involved in this. We, uh, and I'd like to thank Susan Farag as we're, as we're thanking people for preparing the packet. That, it was most helpful. When this topic first came up, um, I was asked whether or not this should be a, a uh, discussion at public safety and the uh, council president and I discussed it and I said, look, everybody's going to, every council member is interested in this topic. Everybody's going to be coming to visit public safety and we love company, not to, not to suggest that we don't, but we might as well do this as a, as at, before the entire council. And I thank the council president for agreeing with that because uh, obviously this is a an, a very very important topic. Okay. We list we listed it as a state police reform legislation, and probably it should have been listed as a police reform legislation by the state because this involves obviously much more. If somebody just read our our our, uh, our agenda, they might think that this only involved the state police. It certainly involves the state police and every other agency in the state of Maryland. Um, Montgomery County has proudly been a leader on much of this legislation prior, not all, but much. I mean, we were certainly uh, front runners for body worn camera, uh, people having to wear body worn cameras, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that that's something that we should also mention. The Police Accountability Board, I agree that we need to start that sooner rather than later. Uh, we are in a bureaucracy. We have to advertise for people who might be interested in being on it. And we need to make certain that we are before the deadline. We shouldn't be waiting till the 11th hour before the deadline that we're actually involved. Um, and we need to make certain that every part of this is funded properly. We do not want anyone to fail because they didn't have the proper resources to do what is necessary to do and what they are required to do. So I think we have to keep that in mind. And I also think we need to make certain that we thank our first responders. These discussions that we've had, and, and we're far, for police officers, firefighters, but not, nothing is, is perfect and, and don't mean to give that impression, but these discussions are for the people that didn't do their job properly. They, there are hundreds of people every day that do their job properly, and we need to make certain that they're thanked and appreciated for what they do. If there's a mistake, 
If there's worse than a mistake, then we need to make certain that it's corrected. But we also need to not allow people to think that everybody is, is doing something that's not proper. That is not fair and that is not correct. And we also need to make certain that all the information that we give, and speed is important. We want the information, you know, everybody wants the information yesterday, and, and we all do. And I'm guilty of that as, as well as anybody else. But the information that we are giving needs to be truthful, it needs to be accurate, it needs to be transparent, and it needs to be obviously correct. So as much as I'd like the information right when we request it, we need to make certain that the information that we're receiving back is the correct information. And I also want to make, as a last statement, I want to thank the state for doing what they did. I know that that, that Senator Smith, I've seen him at, at various events. I know that, that he uh, was not always applauded from any direction on what the state was doing. But the state did the right thing, and they've done it in in uh, in a in a very and it was a very tough thing that they ended up doing. But they did the right thing, and so they need to be appreciated as well for for getting us where we are. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, uh, Council President. Thank you, Chairman uh, Susan. How does somebody apply to be a member of the Police Accountability Board? That hasn't been determined yet, as far as I know. So I think that's something that Chief Frank was alluding to, that they had wanted it to be a collaborative effort between the executive and the council. Right. He did mention that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, council Member Juwanda. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I'm glad I went after Chairman Katz, uh, and I, I feel like he's allowed me to be a, an adjunct member of the Public Safety Committee over the last <laughs> couple of years, um, which I appreciate. Uh, and I, and I, I want to thank specifically uh, Captain Ermey and uh, give you a shout out. You know, one of the examples of the many things that you all as public safety have had to do over the last several years is investigate threats into council members. And uh, Captain Ermey, uh, I had a horrible threat against my son. He investigated it, tracked it down, took him a while. And I just want to give an example that we are very appreciative of the work that you all are doing. And I want to say that in public. So thank you, sir. Um, the, the other thing I want to do is thank my colleagues. You know, it's funny, January 15th, 2019, we introduced the LED Act. I introduced the LED Act and we passed it 9-0, calling for independent investigations. And here we are looking at statewide independent investigations. Uh, we passed a use of force policy uh, that raised the standard from reasonable to necessary in case of in, uh, in death when deadly force is used. That is the state standard. Um, we, I want to thank Senator Smith, Delegate Wilkins, Delegate Moon, our whole delegation um, that worked on these bills, uh, Speaker Jones, obviously. Uh, but I want to thank what we did in the county and our police department as well, because we set a standard, as we often do, as the largest jurisdiction that helped the state legislation move forward. And, and I think we've been a model. Body cameras were mentioned as another uh, early adoption. And I just want to thank the work that my colleagues did and that we did together to set that um, standard and to help move the work forward and make it easier. Um, I did have one just question and comment for uh, Chief Frankie and team. I think it's critically important that the police accountability process, you know, if you look at separation of powers, the council is the legislative body. We should be writing the legislation. Obviously, we have to work with you all. And I think it has to be hand in glove. This that bill is complicated. There's a lot of things that need to be figured out. And so the people who are identified on our staff, uh, both individually and council staff, Ms. Farag and others, our attorneys, I think we just we I would suggest we set up a process that maybe is already happening, but I'm not aware of. But I'd like to, my office to be involved, and I'm sure colleagues want to be involved in how that is going to happen and then how the public's going to give input into that process. And we just want to make it as we have to move quickly, but we want to make sure that it's uh, we're, we're working with you hand in glove and there's a process for that. And there can have be meaningful input all the way. The worst thing that could happen is you all present us with a bill in three months. Right. You know, so we, and I know you're not suggesting that, but I just want to say that I think we all stand ready to do that and would ask that we work forward in that in that way. Council member, I'll assure you, uh, one of the conversations we had internally here with with my work group is that 
This is definitely, uh, and it says right here in the first line, the governing body of each county must establish a PAB. So we're looking forward to the collaboration and looking forward to seeing what uh, the governing body comes up with. Uh, and I will say timeline wise, we have another meeting in about a week and a half, and we're expecting some follow up information from the state on this particular legislation in that meeting that will help guide what is occurring across the state and give us uh, some more insight into uh, in, into uh, what the legislature was was thinking and some other things that are going on. So uh, I think we're well on our way. But they're uh, going back to Council Member Katz. We have a very short window. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Rice. So I'm just going to be very brief and just want to say, uh, Captain Frank, uh, excuse me, AC Frank, uh, that. Um, what you're doing and what we see in terms of reforms are working. And I saw it firsthand. Uh, this past Friday, I was at the Seneca Valley Northwest High School football game uh, in which we had a number of incidents. Some of those incidents were reported in the media and kind of blown out of proportion. But what I will tell you is this, is that what I saw between the couple of fights that were there is officers that let school security lead and interact with the clients while still ensuring the safety of all of the individuals involved. And it was very interesting because it was not a show for me. They, uh, some of the officers didn't even know I was there who were the initial ones who responded to the first fight. Uh, and what I saw was very different from what I would have normally seen in terms of how the situation was handled and how officers interacted uh, with the students and the general crowd and manage crowd control. It led with safety. It led with ensuring that the utmost care was given to understanding that these are still children uh, and how best to ensure uh, the safety of the crowd, uh, the safety of the individuals who were still involved in the altercation. It was just done right. And I left there saying that it was an unfortunate incident that I saw but it was one that showcased how when we have these reforms in place, things actually work for the betterment of our community as a whole. And so I just, I just think it's important for the public to hear, for, as Councilmember Juwando says, uh, the millions that are always watching at home to hear that some of this stuff works and it actually gets us to exactly where we want to be. A police force that's designed to protect and serve our community, to keep us all safe, and to make sure that everybody's rights are, are still protected and valued. And those are uh, incredible things that we tout ourselves as one of the best police forces in this nation, but certainly one in which I know with these reforms and state reforms that we have, as well as, as you heard from Council Member Juwando, local reforms that we've put in place certainly cement ourselves as one of those. There is no question. And again, I saw it firsthand. So I just want to say thank you to you, to all of the police leadership, to all of the men and women who continue to put themselves on the line, who are out there uh, in, in the way of danger, uh, but who are also making sure that our folks remain safe and our folks remain respected uh, and protected and served. So thank you. Thank you, council member. My internet might be going in and out. Can I? Can you all hear me? All right, getting a signal. Um, uh, well, Chief and your whole team, thanks uh, to all of you for coming in. Thanks for all your, uh, we're looking forward to the continued um, collaboration on the Police Accountability Board and, and many other measures as they go into effect. Um, we are all really grateful for your service and sacrifice and wanna continue the teamwork moving forward. Anybody else? Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council Members. I'll pass along your message to uh, Chief Jones. And, and again, we you got a lot of great police officers out here that are working hard and just uh, looking to meet the public's expectations. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Stoddard, too. Thank you. OK, uh, I think next, colleagues, is the consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. And thanks, Mr. Farag. Sorry, Councilmember Rice moves. Councilmember Navarro seconds the consent calendar. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is nine. That is unanimous. Um, now I believe we can take our recess till 1.30 p.m. Um, we'll be having 
a virtual lunch, of course, with the Maryland Association of Counties at noon. Thank you all so much. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're having a working lunch uh, today, as usual, and we're so planned, uh, so pleased to be joined by the president of MACO, the Maryland Association of Counties, Michael Sanderson, uh, for his annual briefing. Michael, we're so glad you uh, made the time for us. Take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, uh, I will first, I'll start by offering regrets on, on behalf of the elected president of the Maryland Association of Counties, uh, um, Commissioner Wilbur Levengood from, um, from Caroline County has been my partner in reaching out and, and joining elected officials across the state as we do throughout the year. Um, he had hoped to clear time to join for this virtual meeting today. He's in the midst of some complicated family circumstances uh, with a, the arrival of a first grandchild and is in transit in Montana, sends his regrets so uh, I'm sure I'll have an opportunity co to connect with a number of you at our upcoming winter conference, but he sends his best. So Thank with you. that, um, uh, usually uh, this is a good time of year to have a fairly informal and sort of sprawling conversation about state policy and so forth. What, what I'll hope to do is, uh, uh, for the most part, abandon the materials that we sent you all in advance. I, I like to get you a packet of materials that are things we've been covering through the media from the Maryland Association of Counties and issues that we've been engaged in. And I um, wanted to give you that as background, but I think what, what probably is the best use of everyone's time would be, let me hit a few high notes and if I don't get into uh, sufficient detail on something, or if I miss something that you all would like to talk further about, uh, an exchange is probably a better conversation than just uh, me talking for a really lengthy amount of time. So let me carve out a bit of a window and we'll take it from there. Um, the, the legislative session ahead in Annapolis uh, as far as statewide policy and, and so forth, that many of many of those things will will affect counties, your budget, and your priorities. Uh, we'll have two fun contours for this coming year. Uh, every four years, as you all know, we're treated to uh, a re-election cycle, which which carries with it um, a certain a, a certain effect on on the political dialogue and so forth. So we're we're used to that four year cycle. Uh, a couple of years after each 10-year census count, we have the redrawing of districts, both for uh, representation in Congress, but also for the, the Senate and the House, the Maryland General Assembly. And uh, 2022 will be the double witching hour where we get to do basically both at once. So the degree of difficulty for the legislature ahead is a couple clicks higher than ordinary. Uh, the lay of the land for redistricting seems relatively clear in the months ahead. So for the benefit of your viewers, but also for, for you and your staff, it seems pretty clear that the General Assembly intends to convene a short special session to deal with congressional redistricting in early December. Uh, the word around town, it'll be the second week of December. That'll put it right around or possibly overlapping Mako's winter conference. Life sometimes sends you a lemon here or there. Uh, so we may lose some of the otherwise uh, eager participants in our conference. But uh, the General Assembly will convene to talk about districts for the U.S. House of Representatives. And that process is underway. If you've been following the headlines and, and the various work sessions, there are two separate commissions in engaging public input and drawing draft maps of what maps might look like for, for districts for the next decade, one of which was created essentially by the governor, one of which was cre created essentially by legislative leaders. In Maryland, this is principally a legislative process. So if you're trying to keep your eye on the ball, the work product from the legislative uh, redistricting commission is most likely to be the leading candidate for action in the General Assembly. Um, that's probably going to get tied up in early December. The Constitution in Maryland requires the governor to make a proposed map for Senate and House districts for the state legislature at the opening of the legislative session. And so it might not technically be unconstitutional, but it would be untoward for the General Assembly to have already acted on that 
by the time the governor meets his constitutional obligation. So that'll be an early part of the January legislative session agenda. Expect that to be something like a week or 10 days and done in the month of January. If, uh, if you're counting backwards from the filing deadline, as many current and would-be candidates may well be, the filing deadline is February 22nd. If the General Assembly finalizes a set of maps for House and Delegate seats by January 20th or 25th or thereabouts, you're talking about a roughly a one-month period, which is cutting it close, but gives everybody at least an opportunity to see the maps and, and know how that might set up. So that'll add some a little extra political repercussions in the legislative session ahead. Uh, pretty often, uh, when I have the opportunity to join you all, um, we talk about fiscal issues as the big umbrella, particularly if the setting in Annapolis is such where the state budget is in some degree of stress or crisis, and we're wary of budget cuts or cost shifts that might harm your local services and your local priorities. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't appear to be that circumstance. The, the, the state just closed out the books for the last fiscal year with a cash surplus of well over $2 billion. Uh, we've already seen some salvos being sent into the media sphere about how the state might spend some of its uh, momentary largesse and whether that would look like rebates to taxpayers or launching new programs or doing some capital projects or other sorts of things. I think that's more likely to be the flavor of the fiscal debate for the most part for the year ahead. Year ahead. I, I hope we're not in a uh, fending off a hundred million dollar budget cut or eating more costs of teacher pensions or other things like that that happen in lean and difficult times at the state. So I hope we get a year off from those sort of debates and we can instead, instead talk about our mutual priorities. As I mentioned that, um, obviously the state is still in the midst of, and hopefully on its way out of this pandemic, uh, both a health and economic crisis. And I think policy and spending related to that will continue to be front burner. Uh, an issue of the moment receiving, and I think deserving quite a lot of attention is our collective effort to, to keep people from being unfairly evicted if their economic circumstances uh, for their rental, pro rental property is a function of the pandemic we're part of. Uh, Montgomery County, along with your municipalities, along with other jurisdictions and the state, all have resources to be helpful. And that is proving to be imperfect, but effective as a means to keep us from having a, a sort of a tsunami of pent-up eviction proceedings. Uh, we're not at zero, but we're also not underwater in the way that some other jurisdictions across the country um, have found themselves. So I'm hopeful that that'll remain on a positive course. Uh, we have gotten some good productive concessions from the federal government leadership, uh, the U.S. Department of Treasury, did some restatements of its guidance deliberately based on feedback they got specifically from Maryland program um, program heads, including some from Montgomery County. I think that's been helpful to clear some of what might have been red tape getting in the way of getting assistance out to people and families who need it. So I'm optimistic on that front. Um, is it possible that Maryland reinstates an actual moratorium or the equivalent on evictions? It's possible. Uh, I hope that that will prove to be unnecessary and that the aid programs will address this problem satisfactorily. But I, I think we'll still see nibbling around the edges on uh, local initiatives on how to target ARPA funds and the various federal funds. It would be a welcome turn of events if the federal government actually delivers on an infrastructure bill that, is, as we know, is kind of gummed up in the perpetually complicated process uh, in, in the U.S. Congress. In the event that that shakes free, we could be talking about dusting off a variety of very much needed infrastructure projects across our state, both at the state and local level, and, and make some, some great ground on that front, some pent-up demand on that, on that front as well. I'll, I'll tick off just a couple other topics that have been uh, hot and, and uh, good conversation topics in other jurisdictions as, as conversation starters, if nothing else. Um, the Maryland's commitment to rolling out and extending broadband access is at an all-time high. 
uh, as a function of providing educational opportunities, also economic development and promoting equity. You accomplish all of those by getting more people connected to high speed access. The, the, the anecdotes of kids trying to get their homework done at a parking lot at a fast food restaurant have resonated in ways that nothing else has ever done before. The iron's hot, the feds have shown up with funds. It's an opportunity to get an even higher share of Marylanders connected. We've been successful in broadening the focus on that issue. It's not merely tiny underserved rural you know, the communities that are missing out. There are pockets in every jurisdiction, including Montgomery, that are not sufficiently served by the, the, the private market at the moment. We can connect a lot of dots in the year or, or years ahead. Sort of accompanying that as, a, as another takeaway from the pandemic and the advent of remote work and meetings like these, I think has been um, a heightened focus on cybersecurity. Uh, we almost don't go two or three weeks without seeing another local government, even in the state of Maryland, get targeted by, you know, we've, we're holding your data hostage and, and we'll uh, you know, ransom it for Bitcoin. Uh, this has become a productive industry for certain players. Uh, being prepared um, is important. Having a plan for recovery is important. And the challenge is even higher now that the share of people bringing their own device and their own remote access is far greater than it used to be. Uh, being able to send the tech person down the hall and get everybody's patches upgraded used to be a matter of a hallway. Now it's a matter of all across the county. Uh, that's a different frontier. Um, having some state leadership and resources, hopefully without mandates and, and cookie cutters, I think is a productive way forward on, on an issue we're all care about. I'll make a quick mention of education as that's been a hot conversation topic as we've talked in, in years past in this setting. Um, the, the biggest issue on my mind at the moment with education policy is how, how much comfort are we going to have with the student count that was just conducted on September 30th? Uh, last fall, in the middle, of the, deep, the deep sense of the pandemic, we ended up with a lot of school systems reporting that their school count was down six, eight, 10, 12%. And the state ultimately made, I think, a wise judgment and policy to more or less skip that enrollment count and figure it as noise rather than news. What's going to happen if this year's count is 3% off or 5% off? That some of those kids have come back, but not all of them. Um, do we have a data problem there as well? And if so, how do you remedy that? Does it require legislation or does it require just some patch over funding like the governor proposed last year? I don't know what lies ahead on that front, but technical modifications to something as consequential as the whole Kerwin funding plan over the next 10 years, um, even just a, you know, just a nip and tuck to a program of that magnitude ends up being consequential fiscal policy. So I've got a pin put in that, and maybe in the next two or three weeks, we'll start to get a flavor of what stakeholders believe this year's count is good, or we may need to patch it over somehow. Um, with that, there's, there's a pretty wide range of things that I could get to. Transportation funding still in the balance, and I think will be a focus uh, at a lot of levels, including the county and municipal governments. Uh, we're in the implementation stages of police reforms, and that has complicated contours for county governments. Um, independent of the policy of, of accountability for officers, the specifics of uh, um, implementing a body camera program, but then having a countywide accountability board that nominally seems to oversee municipal officers, there's some new frontiers there that may or may not get some legislative refinement in the year ahead. I, um, there's 20 minutes to be had on that if you want it. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment. That's a quick smattering of, of policy issues that have been coming up in these conversations in other jurisdictions. And hopefully that kicks off uh, whatever is on your collective minds. And I'd be happy to uh, field any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you so much. You mentioned ARPA funds, and I, you're reminding me, have you seen counties uh, using ARPA funds in creative ways that um, Montgomery County is not yet or might want to consider? Um, I, I think we're, we're seeing the many shoes starting to drop there. 
And I will tell you, we had uh, we did a, a full day symposium on ARPA plans and so forth, where we had, I think we ended up with 17 counties physically present. Uh, we had a presentation by the nonprofit community, and I came away really impressed with their potential to be a force multiplier on a lot of local initiatives. So it may well be that some of the some of the most exciting innovations that come with using ARPA funds may turn into not just launching a new county guided program inside the structure of the county government, but finding um, finding deliverers of the services who may be outside government and creating a, you know, a, a two or multi-way partnership with nonprofit players. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of that in the weeks and months ahead. I don't have chapter and verse to recite to you all today, but that's the sort of thing that we'll be doing a lot of coverage of and in the, in the writing we do on the Conduit Street blog that I think reaches you all on, on a Friday wrap-up around noontime every Friday. I love the Conduit Street blog and learn a lot from it. Sometimes I don't learn from our own uh, government <laughs> PIOs, um, uh, including things that are happening in Montgomery County. Um, colleagues? Any questions so far? Okay. Well, if, if, if that rounds things out on policy, I'll just make a really quick plug uh, we are um, we are putting together plans for an in-person conference in December in Cambridge. I can't hear. Is it just me? So December eighth through tenth um, in Cambridge at down Dorchester County. We will anticipate being in person and having some more physical spacing, much like we did for the summer event. So the rooms will be larger and the seating will be a little more spaced out and that sort of thing. We may have a cap on overall capacity for those of you who have attended that event in the past. It's in one large facility, which we tend to fill up. So we may be in some outdoor heated tents and some other things uh, to, to give folks a little more elbow room, recognizing the circumstance. But uh, hopefully, the situation on the ground uh, merits an, an opportunity for that, you know, that uh, that camaraderie that comes with being in person. So we're looking forward to that as well. And content is rolling out in the weeks ahead. Right. Now, many of us enjoyed your summer conference. Uh, will you have a mask requirement this time indoors? We will. We will follow what the guidance is from our public health leaders. At the moment, what we're asking is everybody who registers as an acknowledgement that there are going to be restrictions of one sort or another. Um, if things are really rough on the ground, we may very well impose a full requirement. I can't envision a circumstance where we don't um, alert people as they come to the facility that we ask people to wear a mask and ask people to engage in distancing. So that'll be a strong recommendation from us. And I think that's the floor. Great. Okay. Thank you. Council Vice President Albernoz. Um, thank you, Mr. President, and welcome, Michael. It's good to see you. Um, I plan on coming in December. I will be wearing a mask, um, and I hope everyone will as well. Um, but appreciate your continued leadership and attended. Att I enjoyed attending part of the summer conference this year, which you guys did, as always, a great job of. Thank so um, I'm sure you're feeling this. Uh, we certainly are. There's tension uh, sort of across the board in a variety of different areas. Um, and I think this intersection between the work of boards of education, councils, municipalities, the state um, has never been more important and the coordination of those efforts. The best part of MAKO for me is always the coordination and the discussion with our colleagues from other jurisdictions. But quite frankly, it's also a chance for us to catch a breath among colleagues uh, from other uh, forms of government. And so I do think it would be beneficial to all of us for us to be more intentional about inviting uh, and, and trying to actively encourage members of our Board of Education, uh, create more time and space for members of the delegation uh, to, to, to interact with us as well. Um, and so if there's an opportunity to create time and space to really ensure that there's a cross-section of uh, elected officials at various levels of government, I think that would be helpful. And moving forward, having sessions that are intentional in bringing us together um, to have some, some tough conversations uh, and an and important dialogue would, would also be very productive. And 
Um, and, and I always uh, respect very much uh, the panel presentations that are done during the conference. And I, I believe you guys make the opportunity to submit questions in advance available. Um, I think it would be even more important for us to be able to do that to, uh, to maximize our time together um, even more effectively. So uh, an opportunity to, to submit advanced questions, particularly of panels, um, because you know, there's sometimes awkward silence uh, when, when uh, you know, people are busy and they're often multitasking. I know I certainly am. Um, but that would be another way of getting productive conversations going and making the dialogue uh, even more efficient than it already is. Um, well, very much welcome the suggestions. I'm, uh, I'm a big believer that I want to have at least one item in the hallway. I mean, our, our conference is good at having four or five breakout sessions at once with a variety of different topics. And it's really easy to fall into the rut of throw three speakers at the front of the room and have them talk for 45 minutes and wrap up with Q&A. And there's a lot of content that lends itself to that model. And we want to make those as effective as we can. I also want very much for there to be something that looks and feels different at every time window. I want to have a session that's very much audience driven or um, sort of a back and forth debate or things along the you know, hands on. We've done you know, work tabletop exercises and things like that. I like to have a few different flavors sprinkled in, uh, but both of those comments are, are very well taken. I, I appreciate it. Okay, anyone else? Um, Michael, did you get through your whole presentation? Um, I, I think I've, I've, uh, go ahead. Jump if you have more questions, that's great. I've, I've covered everything that I felt like I wanted to, but uh, open anything else you got. Councilmember Katz, were you trying to get in? No, but I did want to welcome Michael as well. It's always good seeing him. Are you actually in Annapolis as we speak, so you had less travel time? Is that what we have? Um, I'll, I'll do you one better. I'm actually in my home office today. So um, I've been working very hard on the background for, for my one day being graded by the room raider if I ever attain that kind of level. But uh, <laughs> nonetheless, working from home. So um, I missed the opportunity to have a candid lunch in person and, and chit chat over snacks. That's always great. And uh, we'll look forward to getting back as, as circumstances uh, afford, but uh, happy to dial in today. Well, thank you. And thank you for all that you do. You do a marvelous job. You, tru you truly do. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. All right, Michael, you may have uh, covered everything for us. We really appreciate your time uh, and your continued partnership and look forward to uh, hopefully we'll see you in December. Very good. Thank you all. And thank we'll you. give you we'll give you a nine on the room later, <laughs> Michael. Okay. 9.5. I like, I'll take that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we can now adjourn until 1.30 for public hearings. Thank you.